a service of KIBMRadio.com, the Internet's home for an all-old-time radio. And now, the life of Mary Southern. The mill workers' wives and Sanders managed to keep their husbands at home the night of the scheduled meeting, and Max Sanders was not voted out of office. This delay meant everything to him, because Jeffrey Barton is expected at four o'clock today to bring the final papers necessary to close the proposition which Max has been negotiating. Once the news is published that Max has brought a new business to Sanders, the townspeople will feel differently about him. Right now, however, there is resentment against Mary Southern. The men feel she influenced their wives to trick them into remaining away from the meeting. It is a little past four. Mary is at the Stratford bungalow with Phyllis, Max's crippled sister. They are waiting to hear from Max. <laughs> you know, Mary, Max was his old self when he came by here this morning. He and Danny swapped wisecracks like a pair of radio comedians. <laughs> well, he's so happy that this proposition of Mr. Barton's is finally going through. Oh, it'll be like old times when things start humming again. Maybe now Danny will be able to find a job. Why, he's been so worried since he's been out of work. Of course he will. And you'll take that trip to Switzerland to be cured. We'll see to that. <laughs> I've been pinching myself ever since Max told me he'd arrange for those treatments. <laughs> Just think, Mary. Me walking again. Playing with my babies. Having fun with Danny. Oh, it just doesn't seem possible. Oh, you poor darling. I can imagine how I'd be if I were in your place. You've been so sweet, Phyllis, that it makes me ashamed. You know I've had my bad moments, man. Well, we're only human, dear. And those bad moments of yours are very few. I'd be a hateful invalid, I know. Not to go out of his mind if anything ever happened to you, now. Why, well, he's such a dear. He called me this morning terribly excited because he'd heard the mill workers were blaming me for the postponement of the meeting. Were they really? I guess so. I, um, I did have a hand in it. And I'm glad. It delayed things just long enough. And after today, I'm sure they'll forget their resentment. Hey, what time is it now, ma'am? Let me see. 4.20. Mr. Barton must be here, and he's just about oh. signing the papers now. Oh, it must be mad! <laughs> Hello? Oh, Max, we've been waiting. What? He isn't here. What? He met the train? Why, darling, I don't know. I'm sure he wouldn't change his mind without telegraphing. Perhaps he's taking a later train. You know he didn't exactly say four o'clock. He just said late Monday. And we kind of took it for granted that that meant the last train, which would arrive here during office hours. Yeah, that's what I think, dear. He must be coming on the six o'clock train. Hi, where's the family? In the kitchen, Danny. Oh, gee, I'm starved. Daddy got dinner ready? Oh, hello, Mary. Oh, hiya, Danny. Mary and I are preparing dinner, if you please, my lad. Oh, swell. I could eat a baked cow. Oh, <laughs> imagine the grocery bill if your son inherits his father's appetite, Phil. I'll board him out. Now, listen, <laughs> I'm a growing boy. Say, <laughs> oh. hey. hey, that looks like something good uh, on the stove. Uh, uh, now, hands off, young man. That's for supper. And you're waiting until Max gets here to eat. We're celebrating tonight. And... Hooray. Did Max close the deal? Oh, we think so, Danny. Oh. Mr. Barton didn't come in on the four o'clock train, but he's probably here now. The six o'clock came in 20 minutes ago, I think. Oh, but he wasn't on that train. He wasn't? Uh-uh. Danny, you're sure? I'm positive. I just came from the station. What do you think, Mary? Well, I don't know unless... Unless he decided to stay in Chicago for dinner and arrive here at nine o'clock. Yeah, there's a nine ten in from Chicago. Is that the one you're thinking of? Yeah, he could have meant that yeah. one. You'd better phone Max and tell him to come here and have supper. 
But there's no sense of his waiting at the office until nine. Okay, but the poor guy's probably starved. Oh, I doubt it. He's probably too nervous to eat with his Oh, time. call him anyway. You do it now. All right, dear. Hello? Hello, Miss Holly. Get me in Maine, 4264. Thank you. Mary? Yes, Danny? You suppose he's not coming? Oh, no. I'd vouch for his word. Gosh, this has got me jittery. Mm, me too, then. Phyllis is the bravest one of us all. Yeah, she swears. They're ringing the office. Hello? Oh, hello, Max. How are you, dear? Yes, I know he didn't. Danny told us. Oh, Danny was at the station. Max, we think he may come in on the 910. What do you think? Oh, Max, don't feel that way. I'm sure he'll be here. Why don't you come over to the house and have dinner? You'll have plenty of time to meet that train. Please. Oh, Max, why not? Well, whatever you think. All right, darling. Goodbye and good luck. Won't he come to supper? Mm -mm. Wants to wait downtown until that 910 comes in. Did you get Max? Yes, I spoke to him, dear. Oh, is he coming here? No, he wants to wait at the office. Oh, dear. Now, never mind, Snugger Pugger. He'll be here later. He wants us to go ahead and have a supper. Oh, but how can we without him? Well, if we wait for him, it'll be close to 10 o'clock before we eat. Oh, and that's too late, Phyllis. Danny's hungry. Yeah. You must be, too. Well, all right. I guess we'd better. But I guess it'll be a quiet celebration now. Oh, that must be Max now. Gee, I hope so. It's 9.30. Well, hurry and answer it, Danny. Perhaps you've brought Mr. Barton with him. Okay, honey, by you. Okay. Hello, Danny. Mary here? Yeah, yeah. Come on in. He didn't come, Max? No. Oh, Max, says he, he didn't come, did he, Max? No, no, sir. He didn't come. Did oh, that's a rotten shame. A big businessman to make a deal, send wires to be coming, and then just never show up. Why, well, that's not likely. Well, he, if he wasn't coming, wouldn't he have wired you, Max? Yeah, you think so, sir. Believe me, when I get to be as important a corporation head as Jeffrey Barton, I'll do things in a more business-like way. Did you try to call him long distance, Max? Yeah, but his office was closed and his home phone was unlisted. Well, could he possibly be taking a later train? No, oh, there isn't any. Yes, there is. Huh? There's one that gets in here at 11.30. Oh, he may be on that, Max. In fact, that may be it. By late, he could he could easily have been late at night. Oh, Max. Max, I'm sure we finally read the right meaning of his wire. It's late tonight, just as Mary said. Hey, pal, listen, you may have something there. He's probably on the midnight choo choo. Well, you'll have to meet it, Max. Yeah. And he can stay overnight at our house. Yeah, sure. Say, so, I'll sleep in the bathtub and he can have my room if you're crying. Oh, we've oh. plenty of room, Danny. If he doesn't bring Laura. Oh, I feel ever so much better now. <laughs> <laughs> I almost made a baby of myself before. <laughs> well, hey, hey, speaking of babies, is Daddy still with our twins, Mary? Oh, yes. We better go home to relieve him. <laughs> Poor Daddy. He must have had his hands full putting them to bed. He loves it. Yeah, well, we better beat it, though. You know, no sense in all of us waiting up for his nibs, huh? Okay, Max. But let us know if he comes in. Oh, sure. Goodbye, sure. Phyllis. Don't worry. I won't, dear. Good night, Max. Yeah, good night, sis. And stay put, Danny. We know our way to the door. <laughs> okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Drowsed oh, off. Oh, I bet it's late. Well, I we told Rube to watch for Mr. Barton and bring him up here. 
Yeah, well, there's no use us hanging around that station. Oh, I can see what time it is. No. We'll watch us that. Well, I may as well get up, too. Oh. Huh. Max, that can't be. It struck twice. Yes, Max, it is. It says two o'clock. Well, I guess that's that, Toots. I guess Mr. Barton isn't coming. What could possibly have detained Jeffrey Barton? Has something happened to him? Or has he merely changed his mind? Mary and Max are in a frightful dilemma. How will they explain this new turn of events to the people of Santa? to hear is true. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary division. You get a call that an important piece of religious art has been stolen from the oldest church in Los Angeles. There's no lead to its whereabouts. Your job? Find it. To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. What do the latest reports show about Chesterfield? Well, our research laboratory has compared it with the leading cigarettes in the country. Chesterfield is highest in quality, low in nicotine. Another good reason why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you'll find Chesterfield really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, December 24th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary division. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. I'd gone across the street to buy stamps for some Christmas cards I was sending out. It was 9.15 a.m. when I got back to room 45. Burglary. I sat down at a table in the squad room and I started to address the cards when Frank walked in carrying a stack of Christmas boxes. Hi, Joe. Hi. Christmas cards, huh? A little late, aren't you? Well, I wasn't going to send them out Monday, but we had that steak out. You ought to get married, Joe. Yeah? The only system. Faye does all this stuff for me. Laundry, mails, cards. Only system. Might help. You got a big stack there. Ought to cut down the list. Look at this here. Upholstery shop. Yeah. They send me a card every year. I never get anything upholstered. Faye and I ought to go over our list. Cut off a few names. I brought in your present. Want to open it now? No, I'll wait. I always open a couple a day before. Why? Well, put you in the spirit ahead of time. I opened Phil's this morning. Who's he? Faye's brother in Denver. Gave me a magazine. One of those funny ones. What do you mean, a comic book? No. One of those funny ones, you know. No, I don't, Frank. Well, some of the pages have holes in them. You look through and there's a picture on the next page. Oh, yeah, I've seen those on the newsstand. They have cloth pasted in. Cloth? In the ads. If you want to buy a suit, they have a sample right there. You mean you can feel it? Reach right out and feel it. 
It was one for two hundred dollars. A suit? Sure. Cloth comes from Scotland. What's it made out of? Solid gold? No, they got a special kind of goat over there. It's real smooth. Not a goat, Frank. A sheep. Well, it's a special kind of sheep, then, because a suit costs two hundred dollars. You gonna get one? I told Faye. She said, wear the sample. Anything doing? Fanning and Pryor were in on that market holdup. They come up with anything? Pound of air. Nothing else. I hope it stays quiet. I got more shopping to do. I finished. What'd you get, Ann? Stationery set. Some paper and envelopes. Leather binding. Joe, you'll never learn. Well, what's the matter? No woman wants a stationery set. Get her something personal. Well, it's got her initials on it. No, no. You want something more sentimental. Romantic. What'd you get, Faye? It's different in her case. What'd you get, Faye? Sewing machine. That's romantic. Well, it isn't a way. Why don't you buy her a catcher's mitt? Burglary Friday. Yes, that's right. You have the right department. All right, Father, we'll be right down. No, you can tell us about it there. Goodbye. The old mission church, they've had a theft. Collection money? Statue of the child Jesus. <laughs> Frank and I checked out of the office and rode over to the church at the corner of Sunset Boulevard in Maine. The old Mission Plaza Church, founded 1781, the year Los Angeles became a pueblo. The outside was typical early Spanish design, complete with mission arches. It was made of adobe and painted white. They called it the Queen of the Angels. The Padres from down in Mexico built it. The devout Mexicans in town still attended services there. 10.05 a.m., Frank and I crossed through the courtyard. It used to be the old stable, but the Spanish priest changed all that when it became a mission. Stonemasons paved the stable floor and made it a courtyard. They planted grapevines, trees, and flowers. A young priest crossed the courtyard to meet us. He'd been sitting on a stone bench reading his morning prayers, as priests had done here for 172 years. We asked for Father Xavier Rojas, who had communicated with us. We were told he was inside. We entered a side door. The church seemed to glow with the hundreds of votive candles flickering on both sides of the altar and at the shrines throughout the church. It was empty except for a few people praying. Surrounding the main altar were several old oil paintings and gold frames. The air was heavy with the scent of advent flowers. We found Father Rojas up near the sanctuary, looking at the nativity scene. He told us about the crib. It was a $70 duplication of the scene at Bethlehem. The parishioners had taken up a collection for it 31 years ago was put up every year on December 22nd and taken down after the holy season. It was beautiful, except that one of the shepherds had lost an arm, the sheep was old and cracked, and the infant Jesus was missing. Father Rojas led us back into the sacristy. I'm sorry to bother you, man. It's all right, Father. Especially now, the holiday season. We cash our checks, Father. You want to tell us what happened? Or what you think happened? I discovered the statue was missing right after the 6 o'clock mass. Say the six? Yes. I started over to the rectory and stopped by the crib. Was the statue there before Mass? I don't know. But it was there last night. How late is the church open? All night. You leave it wide open so any thief can walk in? Particularly thieves, Sergeant. You say it was there last night, Father. How late? Ten or eleven o'clock. We had confessions. No one saw it after that? One of the altar boys. He says it may have been there. He thinks it was. Did he see it? He's not sure. What's his name? Pardon me. Here's the schedule. You'll find the names for every mass there. Was there a big crowd at the 6 o'clock mass, Father? Not too many. Seven's the big one. People on their way to work. Did anyone stay after mass, did you notice? Not especially. I came back here, took off the vestments. I suppose it was 10 or 15 minutes before I went back in the church. It was empty then? No. People were coming in for the 7 o'clock. Are these the older boys, James Cornine and Joseph Heffernan? That's right. Joe's the one who mentioned it might have been there. Did you check with the other priests, Father? Before I called you. None of them knows anything about it. Just for a check on the pawn shops, how much is the statue worth? In money? Well, that's the point in pawn shops, Father. Only a few dollars. We could get a new one, but it wouldn't be the same. We've had children in the parish. They've grown up and married. It's the only Jesus they know. We understand. And we've had children who died. It was the only Jesus they knew. So many of the people who come here are simple people. They wouldn't understand, Sergeant. It would be like changing the evening star. We'll do our best, Father. That's why it would mean so much to have it back for the first mass on Christmas. It's not very long, Father. Less than 24 hours. If anything turns up here, you know where to get in touch with us. Yes. It's sad, isn't it? 
How's that? In so short a time, men learn to steal. Yes, but consider us, Father. Us? If some of them didn't, you and I'd be out of work. 10.50 a.m. We notified pawn shop detail. Frank and I checked out the two altar boys. The first one, James Cornine, said he knew nothing about the missing statue. The second one, Joseph Heffernan, was not at home. His father said he had a part-time job, but he hadn't get in touch with us right after lunch. By 11.30 a.m., we'd run out of book procedure. We had a man to find. Our only clue? He'd been to church. 11.33 a.m. We checked the phone books for the names of religious stores in the area. Two of them were closed. We tried the third. When we got there, the only person in the store was an elderly man sitting by a table. In front of him was a large, beautifully carved chess set. We're police officers. My name's Friday. This is my partner, Frank Smith. Great to see you. Caught me in the middle of a big chess match. Where's your partner? Up in San Jose. We've been playing for years. Same match? No, just two or three months on this one. What I meant was we've been playing different matches for years. I see. You know, we do it through the mail. I send him a move, he sends me one. Must keep you on your toes. Except during the holidays, the mail gets all fiddled up. That's no good. Guess not. Slows things down, that's no good. I like to catch him off guard. You Mr. Flavin? How do you know? We never met. Your name's on the window out front. Mr. Flavin, we checked the other two religious stores in this neighborhood. They're closed. This is the best one anyway. Fifty percent European items. We're checking the stores around the mission church. For what? Statue of the child Jesus. Do you have one we could look at? Sure. No, sir, a larger one. You don't want a larger one, unless it's for a church. That's why you want a larger one. Could we see it, please? It's not my due to butt in. But unless you live in a big place, this will make your living room all a kilter. Yes, sir. Do most of the people who go to the mission church trade here? Good many of them, especially the kids. Why kids? More religious. Check on yourself. See if kids aren't more religious than you. Might be so. That's what's wrong with the world. Oh, I don't mean you're wrong with it. Everybody. Yes, sir. What if we could stick to the point, Mr. Flavin? Sure. A lot of people from the mission church come in here. Do people ever come in and sell back a religious article? Like a prayer book or rosaries? Yes, sir. Second hand, you mean? Yes, sir. Not since I've ever been around. It's silly. Why? People don't have religious articles so they can get rid of them. They have them so they can have them. But if a man had a statue and wanted to sell it, he'd come to a place like this. Sure, but he wouldn't want to sell it. He would if it was stolen. No, sir. If a man was to steal a statue, he'd be crazy or something like that. The only place he'd want to go is where crazy people are. You may be right, Mr. Flavin. I don't know what you fellas are looking for, but if it's somebody who stole a statue, he's crazy and you won't find him. You won't find him as long as you live, or in a million years. That should cover it. We checked religious stores out as far as Van Ness. We asked the same questions. The owners gave us the same answers, but none of them were as encouraging as Mr. Flavin. Frank and I had lunch and reported back to the office. It was 1.30 p.m. when we started into the squad room. The captain was just coming out. I just checked for you in the lunchroom. Well, we've been out on that theft at the mission. Make it some action on the Patterson case. They locate him? I think he's on the bus from Sacramento. Well, that means the Bakersfield police. We'll wait and see. Are one of you fellows Sergeant Friday? He is. I'm Drew Heffernan. My father said you wanted to see me. Well, sit down, son. You didn't have to come in. A phone call would have worked. My father said to get on over. He says that any kid that uses phones is lazy. We want to ask you about this morning. You serve 6 o'clock mass? Yes, sir. I'm senior boy. So I get the 6. You're senior and you take the early trick? Yes, sir. That way, if you receive communion, you get to have breakfast sooner. Father Rojas says you think the statue was there before mass. I didn't look, but I have a feeling it was there. A feeling? You know, how you have a feeling about something, but you're not sure. Did you stay around long after Mass? I put out the candles and hung up my surplus. How long would that take? About five minutes, maybe. Did any of the people at Mass stay on? Some moms do, especially ladies. Oh? Maybe they don't finish in time, or else they start new prayers. I don't know. So when you left, there were still some women there? No, sir. That was at first. After I went back to the sacristy, there was only this one man. What man? He comes at 6 o'clock all the time. Do you know his name? No, sir. But he works down in Olive. You know, paint shop. Where the paint signs. Could you describe him? Sort of medium. He's wearing a suit that didn't match. Didn't match? You know, different pants than coat. 
How about his age? Oh, he's pretty old. Take a guess. About 40, maybe. There's nothing particular about him. Then why'd you notice him? I've seen him before. In the bundle, I guess. The bundle? Out in front. I saw him when he was coming out. He had this bundle. And he almost dropped it. How large a bundle? It's hard to say. Come on, son. Was it large or small, the size of the statue? Not that big. Yes, sir. located the sign shop. The suspect didn't work there anymore, but we discovered his name was Claude Stroop. We found out where he lived. 2.25 p.m. We arrived there. It was a hotel for men, mostly old men, mostly down and outers. It was called the Golden Dream. Police officers, we're looking for Claude Stroop. Hope Claude didn't get in any trouble. So do we. Is he in? No. He's got room 307. You can check if you like. We'll take your word. Were you on this morning? Hmm? Yeah, the early shift. Well, we don't have shifts. My uncle owns the place. I'm the shift. Did Stroop spend last night here? Came in about 11. When did he leave this morning? Around 6, maybe before. To come back after? 8 o'clock or so. Then left. Supposed to be back at 10. And pulls this trick. What trick? Our program. He knows the other fellas need him. Program? You're here at the hotel. Every Christmas we have a program. Put up a tree and sing. They're mostly old fellas. Singing like that makes them remember back when they were kids. Then Jimmy Finn comes on. Jimmy Finn? He shares number 409. His family once had a lot of money, so he tells the fellas about it. Stories about Christmas. How they had this big log and his grandfather used to start it up. And after dinner, everybody turned over his plate and there underneath was a $20 gold piece. Brand new one. When Stroop came in this morning, did he have a bundle? I didn't see him come in. You said you saw him. I saw him go out after, but not come in. When was that? Eight. If you want to look for a bundle, I could give you his key. We don't have a warrant. It's all right. I know about police. It's all right with me. It's not with us. I didn't mean that. I, I just meant it was all right with me. Good King Wester lost look down on the feast of Stephen. When the they were three old men. We couldn't tell how much better they would have been with Stroop singing the fourth part, but somehow you didn't care. This was Christmas at the Golden Dream, and it sounded fine. Was cruel when the poor man came in sight, gathering winter fuel. This is the last rehearsal. They got most of the songs down pat. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, that's why it's a shame Claude isn't here. He's tenor, and they need him to make it sound just right. Does Troop have a job? No, sir. He used to have jobs. Not much lately, though. Did he say where he was going? No, he should have. The fellas need him. When he comes in, will he call us? Sure, and uh, not say anything to him. That's right. I hope it's nothing serious for Claude. The fellas' troubles ought to be over. Troubles? Way back. It wouldn't count. Huh? Tell us anyway. Well, I don't know much about it. As much as you know. Now, come on. Was well, something back where he used to live. He robbed somebody or something. What else? That's all. It was a long time ago, way far back. But he forgot it all, the robbing and everything. No, not quite. Hmm? He remembered it this morning. God rest ye merry gentlemen, let nothing you dismay. For Jesus Christ our Savior was born upon this day. Back to the office and ran Stroop's name through R and I. If he'd been booked anywhere, we had no record of it. At least not under that name. 4:15 p.m. Pawn shop detail reported back. No object resembling the statue of the child Jesus had been turned in. 4:18 p.m. I hung up the phone. Harrison's on that Sacramento bus. I thought Bakersfield had it. They were supposed to confirm. They did. Up over the station. What about Fanning and Pryor? They're still out. Well, they'll be back soon. When's the bus arrive? Six o'clock. There's plenty of time for him to make it. There's more time for you. We're still on that path. Can it wait? No. What is it? Ten, fifteen dollar statue? When's the price determine a case? I realize it's a church statue, but that doesn't give it priority. It's important to them, Captain. Joe and I promised to get it back. What do you got on it? Nothing much. And why are you so big hearted? Burglary Friday. When? No. Don't say anything. No. Right. It's Claude Stroop. He just walked into the hotel. He's our suspect. Nobody's leaked to him? No. You'll keep. You can run him down tomorrow. It'll be too late then. They need it for the first mass in the morning, Skipper. It's kind of a big thing for them. 
I'm sorry. I can't juggle details around so you can get a statue back. If there's time later on, we'll do our best. Yes, sir. You better get over to the station. Yes, sir. Will you call Father Rojas over at the mission? Why? Tell him we're too busy to work on that statue. But we'll do it later. Tomorrow or when we get the chance. Why can't you call him? Well, we better get over to the station. The Patterson's on that bus. We don't want to miss him. All right, I'll call him. Friday. Yeah. I can send Fanning and Pryor over. You might as well stand that other thing. Whatever you say, Captain. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. There are good reasons why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Why Chesterfield is the largest selling two-way cigarette in America. Why Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. People these days want facts. When you want people to use your product, you have to tell them what effect it has on people who do use it regularly. That's why a doctor has examined for almost two years a large group of Chesterfield smokers. Forty-five percent of them have, on the average, been smoking Chesterfields for well over ten years. What is the effect on these people from smoking Chesterfield? No adverse effects. To the nose, throat, and sinuses, says the doctor. Consider Chesterfield's record with these smokers, with millions of other smokers throughout America. Another good reason for you to change to Chesterfield. Regular or king size, Chesterfield is best for me, best for you. p.m. We arrived at the Golden Dream Hotel. The desk clerk was right. Claude Stroop looked like a man who'd had his troubles at bargain rates. Your name Claude Stroop? Yes, sir. Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. I didn't do anything against the law. Honest, I didn't do anything against it. You haven't been accused. I want to take you downtown. We'd like to talk to you. No, sir, I'm not going. I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going to talk to anybody. You're half wrong already. p.m. We returned Stroop for interrogation. He kept his word. He refused to talk. 6.05 p.m. Frank called Faye, told her he'd be a little late. Stroop didn't move for a whole hour. He sat and stared, but he didn't talk. 6.40 p.m. We got a final report from pawn shop detail. The shops were closed. There was no statue. Stroop still hadn't talked. Don't you ever want to go home, Stroop? If I was to talk, he wouldn't let me go. Depends on what you'd say. I'd say it wrong, and I wouldn't get home. You won't this way either. I'd like to go. You can bet on that. This is the seventh year we had the program, and I never missed a one. And a single one. Why don't you tell us what happens, Drew? How would I know you'd let me go? You wouldn't. I might as well anyway. All right, what happened from mass on? Well, there was mass. I came out and started down toward the hotel. Back up. I left my stuff at the hotel, and then I picked up George's car. I didn't steal it. He said I could have it any time I wanted. Only this time I didn't ask him. I took it and started out. Well, yeah. I should have asked, but I just didn't. I went over to Grand Avenue for the Christmas bulbs where this fellow sells in second hand. It was coming out of the lot that I did it. Yeah. The bumper must have caught the other car. It didn't leave too big a dent, but there was this long scratch. I got out and tried to wipe it off with my handkerchief. You know, spit on it like... Only well, didn't do no good. I didn't think anybody saw. I don't know how you fellows found out about it. I'll check auto records. Right. Stroop, we didn't bring you down here to talk about that. You didn't? No. There's a statue missing from the church. The statue of the child Jesus. You mean I took it? You took a bundle out of church. Yes, sir. That was my other pants for the program tonight. I had a place sewed up and there was a button on it. You can check. I wouldn't take a statue. I don't think you would either. He's clear at auto records. Go on home. For the program? You mean it's all right? Good night, Stroop. Good night. Merry Christmas. Where 
hour, too. Well, I don't know. We could stay and work on it tonight. Wouldn't do any good. We won't find it. I don't think so. No, he's kidding the priest. Build his hopes up. Might as well go tell him now. Merry Christmas. Seven twenty-seven p.m. We found Father Rojas. Frank told him how it was that we couldn't get the statue back by morning, but that we'd keep trying during the week. He said he understood. We told him we had to get on. As Frank and I started to leave, the doors at the main entrance to the church opened. It was a good two hundred feet away. It was hard to be sure but it looked like a small boy drawing a bright red wagon behind him. When he got closer, you could see he was no bigger than a pint of milk. It was a luminous-eyed little Mexican boy with a face as young as yesterday. The priest seemed to know him. Paquito? In the back of the wagon was the missing statue of the child Jesus. He picked it up gently and walked up to the priest. Father Rojas? He just stood there, looking up at Father Rojas. It's Paco Mendoza, the boy from Paris. Ask him where he found it. ¿Dónde lo encontraste? No lo encontré, lo cogí esta mañana. He didn't find it, he took it. Why? ¿Por qué? Todos los años Paquito rezó por un camisito rojo. Este año Paquito rezó al niño Jesús. Yo prometí al niño Jesús el primer viaje en mi camioncito. He says all through the years he's prayed for a red wagon. This year he prayed to the child Jesus. He promised that if he got the wagon, the child Jesus would have the first ride in it. Vendrá el diablo para llevar a Paquito. He wants to know if the devil will come and take him to hell. That's your department, Father. No el diablo. He says ama a Paquito mucho. We crossed over to the sanctuary. With the help of Father Rojas, the young boy replaced the infant Jesus in its rightful place, the crib in the nativity scene. Frank and I could have been wrong, but... The small plaster statue seemed to approve. Mary, Joseph, the wise men, Gaspar, Melchior, Baldazar, the old shepherd, the young shepherd, the peasant, they all seemed to approve. Well, we had to cast a paquito. The priest told the boy to go home. He took hold of his wagon and started the long walk out of the church. There wasn't much we could say. There wasn't much to say. We just stood there and watched him go. Halfway up, he turned to look back. And he went on out. understand how he got that wagon today. Don't kids wait for Santa Claus anymore? It isn't from Santa Claus. The firemen fix old toys and give them to new children. Paquito's family, they're poor. Are they, Father?
story you have just heard is true. The names and locations were changed. Ladies and gentlemen, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, remember your cigarette dealer will be open right up to Christmas Eve, and he can take care of your last-minute shopping problems with Chesterfields. Chesterfields and the special Christmas carton featuring the covered bridge. And now, on behalf of the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company, there are over 6,000 wholesale distributors and 1,300,000 retail dealers, and of course all of us on Dragnet, we'd like to wish you a very Merry Christmas. Ladies and gentlemen, the American Broadcasting Company brings to its entire network one of radio's most unusual programs. Pat Novak for hire. reads that way. Pat Novak for hire. Oh, there's no way to dress it up. If you're in business down in the San Francisco waterfront, everything but murder is a parlor trick. If you rob a few graves, you can pay the rent. And nobody cares if you got sore eyelids. You get that way from winking at too many things. Well, it's a good living if you don't run short of bail bonds and Benzedrine. I discovered that Friday night... After the fight broadcast, I wound up in a little whiskey barrel on Powell Street. I had a Glasgow farmer out of the red when they closed the bar, and I drifted across the street for a cup of coffee. When I came out, it was raining, and the street was deserted. I stood in the doorway and watched the dull neons through the rain. They looked splotched and dim, like watercolors rubbed with a damp rag. It was beginning to rain harder, and... I started out of the doorway when she ducked in and bumped up against me. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, just wait for your blockers on the next one. I guess I bumped into you. Don't go out on a limb. Oh, I'm very sorry. I guess I didn't know where I was going. You seem to be headed in the right direction. How do you mean? Forget I noticed. It's raining awfully hard. Hmm. I wonder if you ever noticed how... When it rains, you feel lonely and lost? Yes. Yes, that's it. How in it rains, you feel lonely and lost. Yeah, well, we're both great readers, so if you'll let me get by, I want to get a cab. Yes, I... I wonder if I could ask you something funny. The bars are closed. No, I... I meant coffee. I'll pay for it. All right. In here? Sure. Come on. The counter will do. All right. What's it gonna be? Hey! You back again? Yeah, two coffees. How come? I'm nervous. Two coffees. You like a bear claw, maybe? You know what we want? Two coffees? Yeah. Be right with you. Thank you. I know it's funny asking you in here, but... I have to talk to someone. I don't know what I'm doing. I won't argue. I've been away a long time. Just a long time. Yeah, the kids will be glad to see you back. Huh? Stop it, will you, sis? Get to the point. Put the show on the road. I think I've lost my memory. At least it seems that way at first. Who are you? I don't know. I suppose you don't believe it. No, but I convince hard. Here you are. Two coffees. Everything all right? Yeah, yeah, everything's fine. I'll be down here if you need anything else. You thought up a name yet, Buster? You'd be crazy to believe me. I guess you'd be crazy, but... I can't remember anything now, look, lady, if you got amnesia, see the police. But you don't believe me. I don't know. Maybe you are, Levely. But if you're off your rocker, go to the police. But suppose... Suppose there's something that happened before and the police would be looking for me. Please, would you try to help me? How bad are you? Do you know what town you're in? Yes. Have you been here before? Do you live here? I think maybe. It seems like a place I've been. 
All right, I'll put you in a cab. You go see the police. No. I feel funny. I think I'll go outside for a minute. I don't want Hilda to know. Please. I'm going to call the police. Mister, your girlfriend's on the floor. Yeah, any suggestions? No, she's your date. All right, here, give me a hand, will you? Well, where are you going to take her? The hospital. She's an amnesia case. I hope your memory's good. Huh? You'll need it for answers. Your girlfriend's passed out for good. Don't tell me. I feel a pulse, mister. You're going to have to start over because she's all used up. Oh, that's good. You got a wailing wall? Sure. Use the corner. I like call homicide. It didn't take 2020 vision to see I was in trouble. Maybe it was an accident, maybe it wasn't. I didn't have any idea why she keeled over there, but with a figure like hers, I knew it wasn't old age. That call to homicide meant Hellman was going to be in the picture soon. And then I'd stand about as much chance as a cornfield in a stone quarry. Well, I went through the girl's stuff. She had no identification. There were a couple of snapshots of her, but no name. I told the waiter my name and where Hellman could find me. And then I got out of there. I looked up Jocko Madigan, an ex-doctor who liked his booze pretty well. Smart guy, but he used a mason jar for a jigger. I finally found him holed up in some after-hours joint on Geary Street. He was talkative. Hello, Patsy. A small jug for Mr. Novak, waiter. I want to talk to you, Jocko. Patsy, you shouldn't be here. It's after hours. Yeah, look, Jocko, I need some help. What do you know about amnesia? Oh, a temporary blessing. I thought I had it myself once. Oh, stop it, will you? But it just turned out to be a case of bad bourbon. A peasant's drink, I've decided. Get up the street level long enough for me to talk. I'm in trouble. Yes? I met some blister tonight who took a dive after one cup of coffee. Oh, I see. She had amnesia, or she thinks she did. Oh, well, she's dead. Why worry about amnesia? <laughs> it's a minor ailment. Because Hellman's going to think I had something to do with it. She picked out my lap. Don't you see how it's going to add up? I have high hopes. i got to do something in a hurry. Uh, was she a nice girl? Yes, I guess so. How come you met her? Oh, what difference does it make? Tell me about amnesia. Could she phony it? Maybe. Not for long. What makes you think she did? I don't know. She acted like a butterfly with a jag on, and she headed straight for me. It just doesn't add. No. What cell block can I find you in? You can get off your spine and go to work for me. You know the hospital circuit. Hit them all and find out everything you can about recent amnesia cases. Well, how far back do I go? Until you find one that jibes with this girl. It's impossible. Where do I start? I feel like Noah when they told him to beat the flood. She's blonde, blue eyes, expensive clothes. How big? Just the right size for a good dream. Start checking now and give me a ring at my place. No identification? Uh, none. She only said one thing when she fell. Oh, something crude? No, she mentioned a gal by the name of Hilda. That should be easy to trace. Sure. Just look it up in the phone book. You will find it uh, somewhere between Hellman and Homicide. Right, lover? Well, there wasn't anything I could do for the next few hours except sublet from an ostrich. I had to keep undercover because all I had to work on was a couple of snapshots and a girl named Hilda. Neither figured to get me out of this mess. Hellman was bound to ask a lot of questions because I had as much business being with a dead girl as Lucky Luciano in a finishing school. After I left Jocko, I took a C car downtown and I went home to grab some sleep. When I walked in the apartment, the lights were out. And that didn't make any difference. Hellman's badge was shining like a lake in Ireland. He was making himself at home with my ice cubes. Hello, Novak. Put the light on so I can watch you turn pale. All right, Hellman, get to the point. Sure. Who was your girlfriend? I don't know. She was the coy type. So are you, Novak. You're going to look good sucking your thumb in the gas chamber? I suppose your coroner is full of good news. She died of an overdose of sleeping pills. The coroner's report is murder. How about the space mark suicide? No dice. You don't take sleeping pills, then tour the town for a spot to take a nap. So she died in a coffee joint. What am I supposed to do, carry a stomach pump? You're supposed to tell me who she is. We'll go from there. I don't know. Neither did she. I've got that down as a lie. You file it any way you want, Hellman. She was amnesia. So are you, Novak. All right, hire a medium then. I told you. She came into the restaurant a total stranger. We got social, but she died a total stranger. How are you going to prove it? I don't know. 
If I knew who she was, I wouldn't play footsie with you. Do I have to draw a map? She came in trying to sort out her marbles and never got there. I see. What did you find out? How about clothes markings? That's your department. How about laundry marks? I don't know. I guess she washed her own. Look, Novak, you're a big boy now. You're in a spot. If you want to help, now's the time to do it. You got everything I know. From here on, you work the ball downfield. All right. You just answer the doorbell from time to time. When you see a guy grinning out there, that'll be me coming to pinch you for murder. Well, that'll take lots of doing, mister, and lots of proof. You remember that. I'll try, Novak. But I may get amnesia. Good night, big shot. When Hellman left, I backed into my headache and went to bed. Oh, sure, I was in a spot now. The scorecard said murder, and I was the medalist on the first round. If the police didn't know who she was, that meant she had no record we could work on. I still had the funny hunch about that gal pulling a phony. But if it was phony, I was worse off. I had all the best arrows in town pointing to me, and once Hellman began to build a case, I could throw away those vacation folders. I slept until about nine. The phone began to ring, and I rolled over, expecting to hear Gabriel on the other end of the line. It was just Jocko. Hello, Novak talking. This is Jocko. I've been working all night. We'll build a monument later. What'd you find out? The morning paper says the girl was murdered. Yeah, Hellman gave me a preview. What'd you find out at the hospitals? I've got a complete list of amnesia victims. I know more lost souls than a Hong Kong bartender. Yeah. Most of them are men. Trying to get away from the little woman. Well, you're a big help, Jocko. Don't hang up till you hear about the girl. Go ahead. Nothing on file for the last eight years. In 1941, a 17-year-old girl walked out of California General Hospital. She hasn't been heard of since. How's the description? Oh, it fits like last year's bathing suit. She was Marcia Halpern, the daughter of Emery Halpern. Yeah? Who's he? A pocket-heavy guy down on Montgomery Street. I'll get right down there. Thanks, Jocko. You saved my life. Well, I hadn't intended to go that far. See you later. Well, it was my one chance, even if the odds looked bad. I called up Halpern's office and said he wasn't in to try him at home. He was listed for a place up on Pacific Heights, so I took a cab over there. When I walked in the lobby, I could tell old man Halpern was making as much money as you can without your own printing press. The apartment made Buckingham Palace look like something George had picked up at a fire sale. The doorman was a sober-looking specimen, the kind of guy that breathes every other Tuesday. He gave me the fish eye as I went up the elevator to the third floor. Halpern's apartment was at the east end. The butler showed me in, and I waited in the living room. It was a real cozy place about the size of a small rugby field. A door opened on the side, and 200 pounds of Regency oozed into the room like a wet ghost. Good morning. I'm Mr. Taylor. I'm Novak. Where's Halpern? Well, Mr. Halpern is away on a business trip. I'm Mark Taylor, the family lawyer. <laughs> I believe that's the phrase. Oh. Well, I'll drop by later, huh? Uh, perhaps I can help you. I take care of most of Mr. Halpern's business now. Did you know his daughter? Uh, yes, yes. It was... Quite tragic. That's what I hear. She was a victim of amnesia. She forgot all the details of her home. Must have been a temptation. Did the police ever do anything on her? The police were not advised. Mr. Halpern hired private detectives, but she was never found. Yes, it was quite tragic. You wear your mourning a long way, Taylor. She'd be about 25 now, wouldn't she? Taffy hair, blue eyes, nice figure. I believe she had leanings in that direction. Why, Mr. Novak? I think I may know where she is. You... Don't know what that would mean to this family, Mr. Novak. You don't know what it would mean to me, Mr. Taylor. Here's a snapshot. Hey, let me see it. Well, Taylor, this is not a B movie. This is a picture of Marsha Halpern. You sure? I don't make many mistakes, Mr. Novak. All right, if you've used up your quota. She's downtown. I'll get in touch with Mr. Halpern right away. No, take your time. She's dead. She... When? Last night, she got sleepy. Huh? Yeah, that's right. Somebody gave her enough sleeping pills to stock a drugstore. I see. After all these years, to come back, and then this. Uh, it was most... most tragic. Yes, yes, I was about to say that. It would be a great blow to Mr. Halpin. 
It would be a very great blow to Mr. Halpin. Have the police any ideas? A few. Do you know anybody named Hilda? No. Why? I'm just sweeping out the corners. When's Halpern due? This afternoon. I'll arrange it. Excuse me, please. All right. Hello, this is Mark Taylor. No, that can't be right. Well, when did it happen? Uh, yes. Yes, please keep me advised. You ought to wear a purple suit, Taylor. I have bad news, Mr. Novak. Raise yourself. I'm lightheaded. Go ahead. Mr. Halpern was killed in a motor accident last night. His car plunged down a ravine near Sacramento. Mm -hmm. That's very strange. Yeah, that must have been a great blow to Mr. Halpern. Well, I left there and went downstairs. All the way down, I had the funny feeling that something was wrong. The way a person feels when he goes into a doctor's office with an incurable disease. It may have been Taylor. I don't know. He seemed all right, but I still had that feeling that something was out of place, like a broken line in a perfect picture. I crossed the street and called Hellman. It was too early in the day because he was as sad as a tap dancer in moccasins. Hellman talking. This is Novak. How's the case? You look better every minute. How's the identification? So far, we know she's a woman. That's right. Her name's Marcia Halpern. She disappeared in 1941 with amnesia. San Francisco? Yeah. She's the daughter of Emery Halpern. Yeah, we'll check with old man Halpern. You better send your best man because he rolled a car and killed himself last night. Where? Sacramento. I got news for you, too. Yeah? We got a statement from that waiter. Who wrote it? He says you brought that girl in for coffee. Also, you were nice and chummy. I knew her for five minutes. With you, that's a lifetime. The guy said you were good friends. That's the way our story's gonna read. You suit yourself. I'm busy. Yeah? Where are you going? Same place you are, Hellman, Sacramento. If I didn't move fast, I was deader than a Philadelphia nightclub. When they start taking statements, you can wire them for flowers. I called Jocko and told him to check up on old man Halpern's estate. I borrowed a car and drove up to Sacramento. The accident was just outside of there. When I got to this spot, Hellman was already in charge. He's going to make a fight for the job and last judgment. They were down in the ravine and Hellman was beating around the bushes making more noise than a Venetian blind in a typhoon. Hello, Hellman. Did you find anything? Get your own hashtag. I'm busy. Where's the body? You get the blues if you don't see one corpse today. He's up in town. Did you notice those tracks up there in the road? Yeah. Double tracks don't mean a thing. Oh, sure. Maybe two cars fell down and one got lost. Wake up, Hellman. If he drove over the side, he sure had a tough time making up his mind. When you're through on that pipe, I'll send over another. I'm going over to the car. Hellman went over to the car and I started looking through the bushes. I don't know what I expected to find. Maybe an old boy scout. After about ten minutes, I shifted over to the other side, and it showed up right near the ground under a bush. Hellman must have seen me because it came right over. Hey, what is it? What'd you find? A handkerchief. Oh. Hmm. That's funny. What's funny about it? So it's a handkerchief. The old man had a nose, didn't he? Well, he must have loved it then. This hanky's loaded with perfume. Take a whiff here. Yeah. Recognize it? Sure. I don't know about you, but I smell a rat. <laughs> Things began to move. This was the first break, and Hellman knew it. I went back to town, and I tried to get in touch with Jocko, but he was running up a tab somewhere, so I drove over to see Mark Taylor again. When I got to the apartment, I found out he wasn't in, but the pinch hitter was all right. When she opened the door, I got a nice warm feeling, like a melted cheese sandwich. She was standing there in a dark, silk evening gown. It was strapless, and she had no worries. When she spoke, it was like saying, put another log on the fire. Good evening. Taylor in here? Won't you come in? Sure. Mr. Taylor won't be in for a while. I'm waiting for him myself. I see. I'm Pat Novak. Is it urgent? Anything I can do? If it were, you'd get my vote. Who are you? I'm Hilda Travis. I'm a friend of the family. Which family? Would a drink take off the rough edges, Mr. Novak? It might. Good, I'll make one. I brought Taylor a present. How nice. A girdle, maybe? Or am I being catty? No, a handkerchief. This one. Do you like it? Should I? I thought you might want it for a keepsake. 
I found it in a ditch up in Sacramento about ten feet from Emory Halpern. Poor Emory. Here's a drink. Thanks. Poor Emory. It's full of perfume. You want to smell? That wouldn't do any good. You want to know if it matches my perfume? It's your idea. Go ahead. All right. Now, closer. That's it. See? Yeah. It's early in the evening, Mr. Novak. Don't blow a fuse. I won't until I find out who killed Marcia Halpern. Good luck. For everybody's sake. By the way, the uh, police think you killed her, don't they? Did Taylor brief you? A little. I asked him this morning if he knew a girl named Hilda. He must have forgotten. Yeah, everybody's got amnesia. Just to make things easy, did you kill her? Just to make them hard, did you? I see. Well, just tell Taylor I called. Don't be a savage, Mr. Novak. You haven't finished your drink. And it's raining outside. I'll finish this one. That's good. Sit down beside me here. We'll finish our drinks and pray for a cloudburst. She turned out to be an old-fashioned girl. She had about eight of them before I got out of there. I tried to pump her, but she wouldn't talk about Marcia Halpern. I just became a family friend. After I left, I ducked into a drugstore and started phoning Jocko. I finally caught him at the hunt room. He'd worked his way below the label already. Hello, Patsy. I'm having a wonderful time. Yeah. What'd you find out? I just heard a funny story. It's old. What about Halpern? He barely changed his will after the girl died. The whole estate goes to her. Who's next in line? A fellow named Mark Taylor. That's the new part of the will, drawn up three weeks ago. Good boy, Jocko. So I looked up the dope on Mark Taylor. He's a family friend. It's a new club. Go on. Looks all right. Some funny bank book stuff, though. For instance? Well, he drew 3,000 bucks out last month for a Lisbon passage. A girl named Helen Dupre. Maybe she's a foreign cinema discovery. Well, he's no talent, Scout. Meet me down in Homicide in ten minutes, Jocko. If we're lucky, we'll show Hellman something. Why? How to draw to an inside straight. Hurry up and don't stop for a bracer. Well, just don't smell my breath. See you soon, Mama. I'd explained everything I could to Hellman when Jocko got there. I went over it for him and sent him out on an errand. He was to meet Hellman and come up to Taylor's apartment. I went on ahead. It was about 11 o'clock when I knocked on the door. Mm, Mr. Novak, so soon. Yeah, I'm coming in. Hello, Taylor. I won't say you're wearing out your welcome, Mr. Novak, but it's getting very thin. You better take time out and pack your bags. Is that nice, Patsy? Because a guy named Hellman wants you for murder. We've been over that once, Mr. Novak. Yeah, but we got a whole new infield this time. Hellman thinks you killed a girl named Helen Dupre. I don't know a girl named Helen Dupre. The bank vouchers say yes. They say you brought her over here six weeks ago. Wait a minute, Pat. Oh, you made the team too, Angel. They got you all fixed up for old man Halpern's case up in Sacramento. Get out of here, Novak. I left a drink here. Find a bar there. Get out of here. I wouldn't want to jam this gun through your face. Come on in, Hellman. Did you bring him with you? Yeah. Come in here, fella. Is that the girl? Yeah, that's her. Where'd you see her before? Sacramento last night. He's crazy. It's a plant, Mark. Tell him more, Junior. You sure she's the one? Yeah. She was on the road, and I seen her at the car with this old fella. Hang on, lady. The road gets bumpy from here on. My lights were out, so I guess she didn't see me. Take this little guy out of here. I got a story. I seen you hit the old fella, then start the car down the bank. I didn't hit him on the head. I told you that, Mark. Yes, you did. Tell him, Mark. Tell him I was here. How can I when you tipped our mitt? That's right, Taylor. Get out while you can. Tell him I was here, Mark. Well, you little fool, don't you know you told them already? You're a bum guy, Mark. You've been a bum guy all along. I keep my mouth shut. I'll give you a chance to talk. I'll tell you about him, Novak. Shut up, you little halfwit. You're all right on the straightaway, but you're a bad guy on the curves, Mark. Keep still, Angel. For a tin horn punk like you, I'll talk lost. You'd better say it fast. Yeah. You get any prize in the house, Taylor. Take your choice. Are you working for a living, Hellman? Yeah. All right, then, let's go. Yeah. See you downtown, Novak. Is she all right, Jocko? I'm out of practice. Well, Patsy. You like it this way, baby? No complaints. I've always gone first class. I wouldn't like it the other way. Yeah. I could have used a little more time. 
But I'm not greedy. Still raining out, Patsy? No. It stopped raining. It's beginning to clear up and over. Come on, Jocko. I'm talking to myself. Well, it seems that Marcia Halpern was dead for years. Somewhere on the other side, a girl named Helen Dupre got the story out of her. She looked a lot like Marcia Halpern, so she waited until after the war and contacted this Mark Taylor. They cooked up a hoax and the pot boiled over. She was supposed to fake amnesia and stumble into the hospital. The pictures in the wallet would be printed. Mark would identify her as Marcia Halpern. The same night they planned to kill the old man the way they did. That way, Helen Dupre and Mark could split the dough. But they figured it wrong. Another girl named Hilda Travers had the story, too. She put the squeeze on Mark, and he blundered. He found out he didn't need a phony Marcia Halpern after all. The new clause in the will gave Mark the dough. So he loaded Helen Dupre with sleeping pills while Hilda gave the old man his last ride. All he had to do was wait for the dough and then split with Hilda. A few things went wrong. Sometimes it only takes one. Helen did her part, but she was no Bernhard. And then at the last minute, she knew something was wrong and mentioned Hilda. I kind of began to wonder when Mark identified that picture so fast. After more than eight years, he identified it immediately. And then... There was that handkerchief. From there in, it was free wheeling. All we had to have was a witness. Oh, that guy from Sacramento? Well, he was some actor that Jocko picked up in the hunt room. Hellman finally cleaned up the mess. Taylor's in the clink. And of course, the girl already picked up her end of the check. Oh, she was nice, too. If you don't mind claw marks. Well, it all worked out, and Hellman's happy, except that actor keeps calling him up for parts. The American Broadcasting Company has just brought you the third of a new series, Pat Novak for Hire, starring Jack Webb. Jocko Madigan is played by Jack Lewis. Inspector Hellman is played by Raymond Burr. Music was composed and conducted by Basim Ablam. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Dragnet. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a burglary detail. An organized gang of thieves is working in your city. Their method of operation is clever and fast. There's no lead to their identity. Your job? Stop them. It was Tuesday, May 7th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Bernard. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to the corner of Beverly Boulevard and Fountain Streets. The Brighton Arms Apartments. 12A, isn't it? Yeah. What is it? Want to try it again? Yeah. Yeah? Miss Anderson? Yeah, that's right. Police officers. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. Oh, yeah. Come on in. Thank you. Thank you very much, ma'am. Sit down. I'll put some coffee on. All right. That's the only way to do it, Joe. What? Coffee grinder here. 
for us. That's what it is, huh? Yeah. You buy the coffee beans and you grind them up because you need the coffee real fresh. I'm going to get Faye one of them. Great gadgets. Yeah, guess so. You never tasted coffee that fresh, Joe. Whole different flavor. Well, if you say so. Yeah. Wait till I get Faye one. You'll be asked over for the first pot of coffee. That's nice. You got a match? Yes, ma'am. Here. It's about the burglary, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. A couple of questions we'd like to ask. Go ahead. We've got the report you gave the officers last night. Now, this list of stolen property. I wonder if you look at it and see if it's right. Here you are. Mm. Diamond watch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The mink. Yeah, that's it. It's the mink that's important. Took me three years working to get that. Sure hope you bring it back. Yes, ma'am. We'll try. Have you got any ideas as to what time the theft might have occurred? Well, near as I can figure, it must have been around midnight. Why do you say that? Well, I got home from work about 11.30. I'm a hostess in a restaurant downtown. Mm-hmm. Go on, please. Got home. The coat was still here. I hardly ever come into the house without checking on it. You know, it's the only real thing of value I got. Yes, ma'am. Well, there it was, hanging in the closet. I went out to have a cup of coffee and pick up the papers before I went to bed. Whoever took it must have been waiting outside. He saw me leave and then came in. Why do you say he? Hmm? Well, you said he must have been waiting. Oh, I didn't mean anything special. You know, just a word. I see. Did you see anybody in the vicinity when you left the house? No. Not that I can tell about now. The corner's a pretty busy place, Sergeant. Lots of people around there. A couple of restaurants. Always a lot of people around. I wonder if we could see how they got in, please. Yeah, right back here. Here, you see, they cut the screen on the porch door and then just reached in and opened it. Mm-hmm. Top half of the door. You had it like this, did you? Yeah, you see, you just put these two little things in the glass part of the door comes out. Always take it out on warm nights. Anything else in the apartment disturbed? Not that I could tell. Seems that they just went into the bedroom and took the coat. That and the watch and the other stuff. But it's the coat that's important. Yes, I understand. I mean, coat means something special to a girl. I told you it took me three years of saving before I could buy it. It's a long time to do without things, Sergeant. An awful long time. Yes, ma'am. Now we had the coat three days, and this happens. Just three days. Hardly even had a chance to wear it. Is the coat insured? I think so. Ma'am? Well, I just got it. I think it's insured. I have to check with a salesman. I, I told him I wanted the coat covered. Boy, I just hope it's in effect. Beautiful coat. Just beautiful. Silver blue. Cost me almost $4,000. Come right down to it. That's about $1,000 a day. We have the serial number here for the watch. Now, is there any way you could identify the coat for us? Certainly. All I have to do is look at it. I can tell. Well, yes, ma'am. But is there any mark, any type of label that would help us in identifying? Oh, yeah. I see what you mean. Well, there's a store label. You could tell by that. Oh, that's probably one of the first things that thieves will take off. Well, I suppose so. Well, there's my initials. They can't get those out. Ma'am? I got my initials on some of the pelts. Had it done when I got the coat. Had it marked right on the skins under the lining. My initials, J.A. You could be able to tell from that. Could you draw the initials for us? Yeah. Wait a minute. I'll get a piece of paper. Right here, Miss Anderson. You can use this. Oh, oh, thanks. Here's a pencil. Okay. Well, you see, it's sort of like this. J.A. Like that. Mm-hmm. Would you draw the coat and show us where the initials are? Sure. You see, here's the sleeve. Then the body part comes down like this. Mm-hmm. The hem's here, and the initials are right there. Mm-hmm. All right, Miss Anderson, this is exactly how the initials are... Oh, there goes the coffee. Can, can I give you a cup? No, no thanks, no. No, thanks. Ma'am. Well, excuse me a minute, huh? Yes, ma'am. Do you really think you're going to get it back? Well, we're going to try. Did the men who were here last night get any clues? Beg your pardon? The men who were here last night, did they find anything that had helped? Not a great deal, no, ma'am. Well, I sure hope they find my coat. I just hate to think about it. What's that, ma'am? All that time. Three years working to save for a coat. Then just to have it three days. You know how the models in the magazines kind of drag a mink coat along the ground? You know, sort of over their shoulders? Yes, ma'am, I guess so. Well, I just had it three days, you know. Yeah. I didn't even learn how to do that. Reports of similar burglaries had been coming into the office for the past six weeks. In each one, the method of operation was similar enough to let us know that we were dealing with the same thieves. All of the homes that were prowled were residences. The owners of the houses were always absent. Entrance to the places was made through a rear window. In those cases where the window was open, the screen was cut. Where the window was locked, the pane of glass was broken, and the entrance made that way. The classification of goods stolen was also the same in all of the burglaries. Pieces of jewelry, whatever money was found, and fur coats. 
The only room fouled was the one where the fur coats were kept. None of the valuables in the rest of the house would be touched. Bulletins had been gotten out to all of the pawn shops in the area on the stolen pieces, but there'd been no replies. The M.O. had been checked with the stats office, and the possibles that they came up with were checked out. We failed to come up with a suspect. The investigation of the crime lab on the scene had produced no tangible evidence. Frank and I had gone over the burglary reports time and time again, trying to find something that would tie the thefts together. None of the victims were acquainted with each other. They all lived in different parts of the city. The coats were bought from different retailers. And yet, within a week of the time the coat was purchased, it would be stolen. Friends of the victims were checked. In most instances, we found that they didn't even know the victim had been in possession of the article stolen. On the night of May 6th, another burglary was reported. Among the stolen articles were a mink stole and a full-length natural mink coat. The coat had been purchased only three days before the theft. The victim had worn it in public only twice. After going over the physical evidence at the scene and talking with the woman, we were no further than we had been. Saturday, May 11th, Frank and I checked into the office. Another one that doesn't go any place. Yeah, you want to get the reports out? Yeah. You know, Joe, there's got to be something to tie them all together, something in common. Well, if we come up with that, maybe we got the answer. You see the bunch down at Chief Brown's office when we came in? Yeah. I recognize one of them. Yeah, who? Insurance man. I'll most likely be down here when we get through talking to Chief Brown. What's the figure the thefts have cost him? A little under $47,000. You know, you stand that kind of loss, you'd do some yelling too, wouldn't you? Suppose. Funny now the stuff's turned up. Well, it isn't doing them any good unless they sell it. I get it. Burglary Friday. Yeah, it is. Mm-hmm. What's your name? What? No, where are you now? Mm-hmm. All right. No, we'll be right over. Right. Well, maybe we got one. Yeah? Woman. Says she wants to talk to us about a stolen fur coat. The woman gave the name of Wilda Chandler. She said that she had some information for us and asked us to meet her in a bar at the corner of St. Andrew's Place and Las Palmas Avenue. It took us 23 minutes to get there. See her? No, we'd better ask the bartender. Yeah. Yeah? Is there a Miss Chandler here? Chandler? That's right. She just called. Said to meet her here. Might be her in the back booth. Didn't give no name. Back booth. Thank you. Hey, wait a minute. Yeah? If it's her or your friend, will you do me a favor? What's that? Try to get her out of here. What do you mean? Get her out of here. All she's been doing is sitting back there playing that song. Playing the song, ordering doubles. We ain't got a girl in here this time of the morning. I gotta carry the orders back to her. Got a lot of other stuff to do. All right, we'll see about it. Well, if you can't get her out, at least talk her into sitting up here at the bar so I don't have to walk, huh? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Miss Chandler? Sit right on, boy. Been expecting you. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I just bet you. Glad to meet both of you. Talked to you on the phone, didn't I? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'll never forget a name. How about a drink for you two boys? No, ma'am, thank you. You should have a couple. Seems to make everything a lot better. I may have several more. You said something about some information on some stolen fur coats, is that right? Yeah, and I got it. Old Max, he's going to be sorry. Old Max? Hear that on the jukebox? Melancholy mood. Hear it? Yes, ma'am. Our song. Is that right? You just betcha. Old Max, our song. Partner that goes... Gone is every joy and inspiration. Tears are all I have to show. No consolation. So old Mac left me. Tears in his fur coat. Uh-huh. Who's Max? You probably sure you don't want to drink? No, ma'am. No, Max, just the tears in the coat. See? This is it. What do you think of it? It's very pretty. Well, that's a lie. It's a lousy coat and you know it. You want to tell us about the stolen coat, please? Yeah, I've been working for Max almost two months and I just found out. Because you think that's pretty dumb, huh? Well, maybe if you tell us about it. Two months. Matter of fact, I just got the message last night, Friday, May 10th, 1.22 a.m., if you want to be exact. That's when I got the message about old Max. Now, look, miss, you called us and said that you had some information on some coats, and I wonder if you'd be kind enough to tell us about it. I just bet you. Would you put this in the jukebox for me? Play number B7, huh? Yes, sir. B7, huh? Yeah, melancholy mood. Oh, Max and my song. You know what? He's a no good. A real no good. This Max, has he got something to do with the burglaries? You just bet you. Old slick Max, he's a pistol. Yeah. Say, how about a drink? No, thank you. I didn't mean for you, for me. Suppose you tell us about Max and the furs, would you please? If that's the way you want it. Max is a thief. Yes, ma'am. Well, you know him? I don't know. A thief. 
Look for him two months, even thinking about marrying him. All the time, he's a thief. What's Max's last name? Barrett. Well, thanks for playing the song. It's real nice. That's B7. What about this Max? Tell me how I was going to wear mink, and this is what I end up with. Now, look, Miss Chandler, if you have some information for us, we want to hear it. But we haven't got time to sit here and keep you company. You think it's all a gag, huh? You just think I'm lonely, so I called you. That's what you think, isn't it? Why don't you tell us? Well, it isn't a gag. I can tell you all about the coats, all about them. Yes, ma'am, that's why we're here. Would you go ahead? Well, I'm a hat checker on a restaurant out in the country. It's a good racket. Got the job about three months ago. Doing real well at it. Then I meet this Max two months ago. Oh, Max walks in. Yes, ma'am. Gives me the big pitch. Now he thinks I'm so pretty, all that kind of stuff, you know? Go ahead. Well, he really piles it on. Now he's got a big deal cooking, and as soon as it comes through, him and me is going to get married. Tells me that while he's waiting for the deal of jail, he's selling insurance. Old Max selling insurance. Pretty funny, huh? Mm. Well, he tells me that the hardest thing about selling insurance is the contacts. You know, getting to meet the people who need it. Contacts. Yeah. And that's where I come in. You see, old Max, he doesn't sell insurance on people, not like on their lives. He doesn't sell that kind. Mm -hmm. He sells what they call uh, personal property insurance on things like rings and coats, stuff like that. You with me? Yes, ma'am, so far. Go ahead. Well, he tells me that if I'll help him with his contacts, he'll cut me on his percentage. Says all I have to do is tell him when some woman comes in with a new coat. It's her name and address, and he'll go see her and make the sale. It's to be simple. All i got to do is get the names and addresses. Did you do it? Sure. How dumb can you get? I gave him the names and addresses. I know there was anything wrong. Can you tell us what names you gave him? I got every one of them. Got them at home. You can have them. When did you find out he wasn't an insurance salesman? Last night, 1.22 a.m., I wasn't feeling so good, so I took off from work. Went by his place. Old Max was just coming in. Got the car parked out by his garage. The backseat is loaded with fur coats, all kind of other stuff. Watches, jewelry. That's when I knew he was a no good. Old Max, a pistol, a real no good. Yes, ma'am. What happened? Well, I asked him about the stuff, where he got it. Yeah? He told me all about it. How he'd been stealing. How all the names I'd been giving him were his sucker list. How as soon as I'd given the information, he'd lift the stuff. All that time... Two months, and I figured he was an insurance salesman. You know what he's doing with the coats? What? Well, is he selling them? Sure. He's got a regular order business. You call up and order a blue mink coat. If you want a platinum stole, just call Max. You'll have it. Is he disposing of it here in L.A.? <laughs> Not old Max. He's too smart for that. Ships the stuff east. Is that right? Didn't I just tell you it was? You just betcha. Max gets an order, and he goes out and sells it. Then he gets a hold of some young kid and offers him a trip to the east. Maybe Chicago, Detroit, New York. Where were the deliveries supposed to be made? Gives the kid a plane ticket and sends him on the way. The carrier know what he's doing? Oh, no. Max just gives him a suitcase and tells him where to deliver it. How'd you find out about the operation set up? Old Max, he told me. Said that since I found out, he'd have to cut me in. Give me all the scoop. Barrett ever been arrested? I don't know, maybe. You any close friends in town, do you know? I guess. Never saw none of them myself. You want to show us where he lives? Sure. I want to see him get his. After the way he lied. Ain't nothing too bad for him. Oh, Max, a pistol. He sell all the stolen goods? What do you mean? Well, do you know where the stolen coats are and the rest of the things? It must be in his apartment. Can't think of any other place it'd be. Got to be there. Do you know if he's there now? He should be. He don't ever get up before noon. Should be there. I just want to see you get him. Lousiest trick in the world what he did to me. Yeah, what's that? Oh, that time him stealing those coats. All that beautiful mink. Look at this. Yes, ma'am. That's a very pretty coat. I thought so, too. Take a close look. Old Max gave it to me to show he was on a level. Take a good look. Yeah? All that mink, and he gives me rabbit. Before we left the bar, we put in a call to R&I asking if Max Barrett had a police record. The office told us that there was none in our files. We asked that a teletype be sent to George Brereton at the CII office up in Sacramento. We also had the name Wilda Chandler checked. She had no record in Los Angeles. 11.20 11.20 a.m. We got Barrett's address from the Chandler woman, and then we called a radio car. The officers took her to the city hall where she could make a full statement. Frank and I drove over to Barrett's apartment. Wilda Chandler had told us that the suspect drove a late model Pontiac sedan. We found the car parked in the garage in the rear of Barrett's address. A preliminary search of the garage and of the car failed to turn up any evidence of the thefts. 11.46 a.m. Frank and I went up to see Barrett. I'll get it. Mm-hmm. Probably still asleep. Uh-huh. Who is it? Like to see you. Just a minute. Yeah? You Max Barrett? Yeah, who are you 
you guys. What do you want? Police officers, we'd like to talk to you. Get out of here, Get All right, now come on, on your feet, Mary. This is all about, anyway. What are you guys doing breaking in here like this? You want to check the closets, Frank? Right. You got no right to come in here and do this. What are you looking for? I got nothing to hide. You didn't act that way when we came in, did you? How did I know you were real cops? You read all the time in the papers how guys say they're cops and then break in and rob people. That's what I thought you were. Only cops. We showed you our identification, didn't we? Well, how did I know it was real? I've never been mixed up with the law before. How did I know you were really cops? How about it? The place is clean. Sure, it's clean. What would you expect to find? Right, come on, get dressed. We're taking you downtown. For what? We want to talk to you. Any talking you got to do, do it here. I'm not going any place with you. You just keep believing that, mister, and i get your clothes on. Come what on. What are you arresting me for? Suspicion of burglary. Are you serious? Get dressed. Okay, you take me in, book me. But you're going to be in real trouble, cop, because there's one big problem. Yeah? You can't prove it. stakeout on Barrett's apartment in the event any of his associates contacted him. We asked his landlady about his friends. She told us that as far as she knew, the suspect was an insurance salesman. She said that he told her that because of his type of business, it would be necessary for him to keep late hours and that he didn't want to be disturbed during the day. We searched his apartment and his garage, but we were unable to turn up any of the stolen merchandise. We took him down to the city hall and got off all station radiograms with special attention to the police departments in Chicago, Detroit, and New York, giving them descriptions of the suspect and of the stolen property. We asked that their pawn shop details check the outlets in their cities. 3.15 p.m. We had Barrett brought to the city hall and we talked to him in the squad room. Okay, you made the booboo. Now, how are you going to get out of it? What do you mean? Well, you've had the chance to check my record. You know I'm clean. How are you going to get out of having me sue you? You got a job? Yeah. Where do you work? I'm an insurance sales. What's the name of your company? What do you want that for? We want to talk to him. I don't want you calling them. They find out I'm down here. Before I get a chance to tell them about it, I'll lose my job. You kind of got this thing a little mixed up, haven't you? What do you mean? You've been trying to sell us how innocent you are all morning. Yet every time we ask a question, you give us a smart answer. Now, if you haven't got anything to hide, why don't you come off it and tell us the truth for a change? I'm doing that. When? What company you work for? I'm not going to tell you. This rate book we found in your car. That's the one? Great Southwestern Life, that it? Why don't you call them and find out? We did. They say they never heard of you. And it isn't them, is it? What are you doing with a rate book? That illegal, too? Where'd you get it? friend of mine. I like to check the prices of other companies, keep abreast of things. What's the friend's name? You know I'm not going to give you that. Hey, who put you on to me anyway? Who said it yourself? We're not going to tell you. But it was that Wilda brought. Who? Who's playing cozy now? Wilda Chandler. She's the one who told you to pick me up, isn't she? Does she have a reason to do that? She might think so. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, I tried to help her out, give her the chance to earn some extra money. Told her I'd give her five bucks for every prospect she turned over to me who bought some insurance. And it worked good for a while. And she started boozing it up. Got to be a real lush. Couldn't trust her anymore. She was giving me a list of bad names, making them up. I had to get rid of her. No. Yeah. Gave her a coat and called it quits. How about these names she gave you? You got a copy of them? No. Turned out they weren't any good, so I threw them away. Frank? Yeah, you got that list? Yeah, here you go. Listen to these. See if they sound like the people Wilda told you about. Pauline Bunnell, Myrtle Briggs, Mrs. Mildred Carlson, Miss Jane Anderson, Alice Beckworth. How about it? You recognize any of them? She's the one, isn't she? I was the bus. She's the one who told you, isn't she? Recognize the names? Yeah. Every one of those people have had a burglary in their house in the last month. There's a lot more names. Why don't you cop out and tell us the truth? I got nothing to say until I see a lawyer. Joe, see you a minute. Yeah, Olson, right away. What do you got? Kid says his name's Jim Nelson. Picked him up out of Barrett's place. Anything on him? Suitcase. Here it is. A couple of fur coats inside him. What about Nelson? Checked him. Got a record. Listen to burglary arrest. One conviction. Where's he now? Got him over in an interrogation room. Who's with him? Rubles. Any trouble? No. Walked in and we took him. Says he wants to see Barrett. Thought maybe you'd want to talk to him first. Yeah, I do. We'll be right back, Frank. Okay. Let's go. Anything on the coats? Haven't had a chance to check him yet. Brought the Nelson kid right in. Anybody out at Barrett's now? Yeah, we called the team before we left. Okay, thanks. I'll call you. Right. Hi, Rubles. Thanks. All right. Olsen, I'll be down the hall if you need anything, Joe. Right, thank you. Your name Nelson, is that right? Yeah. Where'd you get the suitcase? Barrett gave it to me. When? A couple of days ago. I was supposed to take it to Detroit. What happened? I didn't make it. Got to thinking about how he was willing to pay my expenses back there just to take the suitcase. Got to wondering what was so important. Opened the suitcase, and when I saw what was in it, I didn't want any part of it. Tried to give it back to him. Cops picked me up. Uh-huh. You know where he got the coat? No, I don't want to. Anytime a guy's willing to pay expenses back, he's just to deliver a suitcase. There's something phony about it. 
I want no part of the action. You know I got a record. I only stood one conviction. I'm trying to keep clean. You got Barrett here now? That's right. You gonna hold him? Yeah. I'd like to see him for a minute. Why? I'd like to tell him what I thought about the deal he tried to pull. Telling me how he was my friend. All the time getting me to carry the stuff for him. Can you fix it up so I can see him? Yeah. Come on. You gonna be able to nail him? We will now. You imagine a guy would pull a stunt like that on his friends? A guy would do that, do about anything. Yeah. You willing to testify about how Barrett gave you the suitcase? I sure am. I want to see him nailed good. Barrett? Yeah? Turn around here. This friend of yours wants to see you. What are you doing here? Thought I'd be in Detroit by now, didn't you, Max? Just keep your mouth shut. They got nothing on us. Watch him while I get the suitcase for you. Yeah. How about it? You ever see this bag before, Barrett? He should. He gave it to me. Beautiful coat here. Let's take a look at the lining, shall we? I don't know anything about those. The guy sold them to me. I don't know where they came from. How about it? It's right there. Initials J.A. You want to tell us now, Barrett? Barrett? Lousy kid, I should have known better than right, that. You. Come on, let him go. Let him go. Bust his nuts. Sit down, bully him. Sit down, Barry. Oh, kid. It's going good until he stuck his nose into it. All going good. How lousy can a deal get? Well, I wouldn't worry about it. What? You're going to find out. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On September 18th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. Max Rudolph Barrett was tried and convicted of burglary in the first degree, four counts, and received sentence as prescribed by law. Burglary in the first degree is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not less than five years. His associates in the burglary ring were tried and convicted of receiving stolen property, which is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of not more than ten years. Because of the cooperation she gave authorities in apprehending the suspects, Wilda Noreen Chandler was released from custody. Dragnet is a presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio Service. Like anyone else, Van Barclay gave little thought to the precarious nature of everyday living. Had he had occasion to probe the fact, he might have acknowledged that danger is always present and that it can strike quite suddenly. Only Van Barclay wasn't thinking about such things. Perhaps he was too restless to care. A young engineer, unmarried, can get restless. Working in a new, strange city, he can get lonesome, too. Van Barclay was one or the other. Or both of these things on a Saturday night that he came out of a movie and went for a stroll along the Santa Monica Palisade in preference to going back to his hotel room. On the corner, he stopped to light a cigarette. That's when he first noticed it. The car was big and Nash convertible. It cruised by him, came back around the block moving slow. The third time around, he was standing on the curb, staring openly at the girl behind the wheel. Very nice. Young, blonde, 
considerably more than attractive. And she was looking at him just as obvious. Hello. Hello. You've opened a door before, no doubt. Hmm. In other words, isn't it a beautiful night for a drive? Well, isn't it? Yeah. <clears throat> That's what I said. You weren't going somewhere important. No, no, not at the moment. In fact, I was faced with a rather gloomy prospect of an evening at a hotel alone. And it is a beautiful night for a drive. Uh, I suppose it was on the golf course at Biarritz. What? Where we met. That's as good a place as any. Yes, only I've never been there. But I have a good imagination. And then... I remember so well those evenings at Monte Carlo when you'd say to me, Van, you must sit beside me at the casino tonight. You bring me luck. You called me Van in those days, remember? Never Mr. Barclay. And I used to call you, uh... uh, What was it I used to call you? It might have been Darling, mightn't it? Uh, Yes, might have been at that. Or maybe the mystery woman, huh? Beautiful. Fascinating and unpredictable. Especially unpredictable. Oh, that's not very flattering, Mr. Barkley. You might have said, especially beautiful. Yeah, I might have. And meant it. Okay, you win. You're not only beautiful and fascinating and unpredictable, but you're too fast a worker for me. How come? How come what? All this. You're not happy about taking a drive with me, Mr. Barkley? I'm delirious. But why me? What I got? Well, you're not unattractive, you know. Yeah, but, baby, you never saw me before. How do you know what I'm like? Perhaps I like to take chances. Didn't your mother ever warn you about picking up strange men on the street? My mother was rather unusual, Mr. Barkley. She taught me that when I wanted something, there was only one thing to do. Get out and find it. (laughs) Okay, who's kicking? You'll pardon me if I pinch myself. This is something I wouldn't have believed. Sort of like an angel from heaven dropping in your lap. Oh, Oh, I'm no angel, Mr. Barkley. Would you like a drink? You're driving. Then come on, we'll go in. This is the swankiest roadhouse I ever saw. Oh, it's not a roadhouse. I live here. Come on. Uh, It's not a bad little place to hang your hat? (laughs) Hang it, then. We like it here probably have two or three scattered around the country. Oh, no, no. Just a cabin at Lake Anderson. Mm -hmm. Well, I gather you're not worrying much about any wolves howling at your door. Not that kind, anyway. The guy that owns this place must be a movie producer. Your father? My father. And he's not a movie producer, just an art collector. Uh, Perhaps you'd like to take a look around. We have some very nice paintings scattered all over the house. You think we can find our way without a guide? There's no one else here, if that's what you mean. We only have one servant now. This is her night off. Cozy, isn't it? The whole place to ourselves, all 50 rooms. (laughs) Oh, it's not that bad. We'll take a look as soon as we have that drink, I promised you. You feel like pinching yourself, don't you, Ben? This is the kind of thing that just doesn't happen. But it's real. She's real. And she's even more attractive than she looked in the car. And it isn't the cocktails you've had. Finally, she leads you into the library. Like this room, Ben? Very much. Always wanted something like this. The right sort of library is good for a man. I designed this myself. Mm Mm-hmm. Even no interior decorating, huh? You're, uh, pretty complete. (laughs) Thank you. Van, fix yourself another drink. The decanter is over there. I'll be right back. Take your time. This is all very pleasant. You fix another drink, sink into a big leather chair and relax. When you open your eyes a few minutes later, she's back, smiling down at you. Hello. Hello again. Oh, I see your glass is empty. Well, that's easily remedied. I'll pour you another one. Well, this is nice work. If you can get it. Here you are. Thank you. Nice 
perfume you're wearing. Like it? I like everything about you. Good. Then you won't mind doing something for me, will you? Anything, short of murder. Walk over here. To the closet? Yes. Yeah. Now, open the door. There's something I want you to see. Okay. I'll play games with you. I... Hey, I thought you said we were alone. We are, Mr. Barkley. Because, you see, the gentleman in the closet is quite dead. It's a great deal more than you bargained for, isn't it, Ben? Yes. When you stepped into the car at the invitation of the beautiful blonde, you didn't realize what kind of a ride was ahead. It was like a dream, wasn't it? Going to her home, having cocktails and relaxing. And then in the library, you looked into the closet. Fantastic, Ben. Your mind spins, almost unable to cope with the situation. But you stare down at the quiet figure of a dead man on the floor of the closet. You scarcely hear the girl beside you. You'll help me, won't you? Huh? What'd you say? All you have to do is help me hide him permanently. Now, wait a minute. There's a place out in the garden where some newly turned earth wouldn't be noticed, but I'm not much good at digging graves. Uh Uh-uh, baby. You can count me out. I don't know how this guy happens to have a hole in his head, and I'm not asking any questions, but just count me out on any part of his You said you'd do anything for me. Yeah, but I don't go off the deep end for anybody, especially for a girl who's in the habit of keeping dead bodies lying around. Uh Uh-uh. No, lady. Pardon me. Well, I'll be seeing. I think you'd better wait, Mr. Barkley. Oh. Yeah. See what you mean. I see you're wearing a gun, too. Uh Uh-huh. And I assure you I know how to use it. How can I doubt that, with the evidence staring me in the face? Good. Then if you'll just pick up our late departed friend and come with me, I'll show you the place. You know that business about your being no angel? I'm just about convinced. You carry the body downstairs as she demands and go out into the garden. There's a shovel. Start digging. Like I said, dig it big. Sounds like a beach near here. The back of the yard drops off to the beach. But never mind, you've got other things to do. Dig deep and wide. Yeah. Okay. (laughs) Sorry, baby. A heavy shovel full of dirt in her face knocks her off her feet. At the same time, you're leaping clear, racing for the drop-off at the back of the property. It's a wild, frightening scramble down through the rock and brush until you hit the beach, running hard. There are no shots, no footsteps. You're away, Van. Free. Far down the beach, you work your way back up to the highway, catch the bus for town and the safety of your hotel room. You're too upset to decide what to do that night. You want to call the police. But the memory of that blonde hair and those pale blue eyes stops you. You want to be sure before doing anything that will send her to the gas chamber. You turn in without deciding. Next morning, when you go downstairs, the desk clerk hands you something. Good morning, Mr. Barkley. Morning. What's this? A young lady left it late last night. Well, there's nothing written on the envelope. She just told me to put it in your box. Oh. Well, thanks. Hmm. That looks awful green. Yeah. A hundred dollar bill. And... No, no, no nothing? No. I wish I knew your secret, Mr. Barkley. You'd like to know that secret yourself, wouldn't you, Van? Now more than ever. One hundred dollars to pay for your silence. And probably a chance of more if you live up to the bargain. But there's also a chance to play it smart, isn't there? If you can find out more about this girl, her name, what's behind it all. You catch the bus again. And as you approach the big house, there seems to be quite a few people around. At the gas station on the corner, you find out why. All set, Mr. Armstrong. Anything else? That's all, Joe. Thanks. Hi there. What can I do for you, mister? Run out of gas or something? No. No, I was just walking, and I saw there was some kind of excitement around here. Yeah, more than we've had in a long time. They found a body down on the beach this morning. Oh? Somebody drowned? Maybe so. But he got a bullet hole through his forehead first. Oh, murder, huh? Yeah, it looks that way. Guy named Alfred Hamilton lived right up the street. Over in that house? Ridgely's? Oh, no. He used to be over there a lot, but he didn't live there. 
Well, I noticed that there was a police car out in front. Well, that's part of the excitement. Not only is this friend of the Ridgley's bumped off, but Doris is missing. Doris? Yeah, Doris Ridgley. Mr. Ridgley's daughter. Well, that's uh, Ridgley the art collector? Oh, sure, sure, you know. He's about the richest person in the neighborhood. Nice man, too. Mm -hmm. And Doris, his daughter. I remember, I've seen her. She's a blonde, isn't she? Uh, Good-looking? That isn't the word for that girl. She's a peach, and she's beautiful. Yes, but uh, rather hard and spoiled. Doris? No. Why, there isn't a nicer girl in town. And I ought to know. I've been taking care of her car ever since she started to drive. I sure hate to see her mixed up in anything like this. And missing, too. Why, she might be in the ocean herself. Only her car is gone, too. They think she murdered this guy, Hamilton? I don't know. But you ask me, she couldn't have. She's too regular. And if she did, she had a good reason. Hamilton was no good. I never could understand why Doris and old man Ridgely put up with him. There's just the two of them live there, huh? Yeah, Mrs. Ridgely died a while back. Gosh, I hope they find the girl okay. He'd just about kill the old man if anything happened to her. Yeah. When was this guy murdered? Last night. And I can tell you exactly when. Ten minutes to eight on the nose. Oh? How can you be sure? Because I heard the shot. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but I did notice what time it was. Because I was just getting ready to close up. Did you tell the police that? Yeah, sure, sure. Where did the shot come from? How should I know? It was just a noise. Maybe from the house over there. Maybe from the beach where they found him. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Hey, you. Say, who are you, anyway? Nobody important. So long. As you walk away, you feel sure about one thing. That Doris didn't murder Hamilton at all. She was covering for somebody else, wasn't she, Dan? And you've got to find her and bring her back. But... But where is she? Suddenly it hits you. The cabin she mentioned. Yes, at Anderson Lake. You decide quickly, Dan. Next stop, Anderson Lake. Hello, uh, young fella. What can I do for you? Got everything here body needs. Groceries, notions, drugs, fishing, tackle. No, I was looking for somebody, Pop. Thought maybe you could give me directions. I'm the person to come to. Can tell you about anybody in Anderson Lake. And who you're looking for? Doris Ridgely. She's got a cabin up here, hasn't she? Yep. Well, uh, how do I get there? You don't. Huh? Why not? Wouldn't do you no good. Why not? Nobody there. But I'm sure Doris is up here, and I've got to find her. Well, if you got eyes in your head, you wouldn't have to go to no cabin. Huh? <laughs> if you look across the street over there, you'll see her car in front of Jake's cafe. She's eating inside. Okay. Thanks, Pop. He's in Jake's cafe. And you wait outside until she comes out. As she gets into the convertible, you flip around the other side and open the door. Hello, uh, baby. It's a nice day for a drive, isn't it? Mr. Barkley. Don't reach for your bag. I'll take it instead. I'll take a look inside, too. Yeah, just as I thought the gun. You still got it. Well, I'll just keep it this time, if you don't mind. Look, Mr. Barkley. Now, just a minute. I'll do the talking this time. First, I'll give this back to you. Even if I had a price for this sort of thing, it wouldn't be $100. It's all I had last night. I said even if I had a price. I don't. I'll keep my mouth shut until I'm ready to talk. Or you are. But what makes you think I have anything to talk about? Now, look. I think I know a good kid when I see one. If you're really in trouble, I'm sorry. But I don't think you are. I don't think you killed this heel, Hamilton. I think you're covering up for something. No, no, I'm not. I, I killed him. He was threatening me. Threatening to, to, to tell something about me, and I killed him. I don't believe you. All you did was try to get me to help cover up somebody else's work. No, that's not true. Okay, so you're not ready to talk yet. Come on, let's go for a drive. Well... You know... I'm sorry I had to smother you with that shovel full of dirt last night. But I didn't like the prospect of sharing that hole in the ground with Hamilton. You mean you thought I'd... Oh, no, I never intended to do that. Well, how'd you think you'd get away with it then? Just let me walk away to tell the cops? I don't know. I don't know. Okay, baby, keep your chin up. Of course you don't know. You were mixed up in something you knew nothing about. You couldn't have killed this guy, Hamilton, any more than you could have killed me. So, come on. Come clean. I... No, I, I can't. All right, now, look, whoever this is you're covering up for, they'll be found out eventually. Probably they had a good reason for doing this, from what I hear about Hamilton. But now you've got to get yourself off the spot, and me, too. We're accessories to the murder. Yes, I know. I... Look, why are you doing this? Why did you come here? I'll show you why. Does that answer your question? 
I... No talking now. Come on, start driving. We've got to have a little talk with the police. Well, Van, you found her, and she's grateful. You can see that. The way she smiles at you weakly, wonderingly. And perhaps later, when it's all over, you can pick up the dream where it left off. You think about it, you drive back to the city with her. Then as she swings the big convertible into San Vicente Boulevard, she suddenly slams on the brakes beside a police squad car. Hey, what's the idea, baby? We don't want a squad car. We want to go to police Officer? headquarters. Officer! Arrest this man. He's wanted for murder. And be careful. He's got a gun. You can't believe it's happening, can you, Ben? But it is. And later at police headquarters, your dream has turned into a nightmare. As Doris pours out a wild story to the chief of the Homicide Bureau. Yes, y- yes, they, w- they were both at my house last night. They left together. Then I-, I heard a shot. When I went out looking, I found Mr. Barkley standing over Hamilton's body down on the beach. He- he'd taken his wallet. What? You'll find it in his pocket right now. The officer here already has the murder gun. Are you kidding? Why, I haven't any wallet. I don't easy, have a... Easy, easy now. Well, seems you do have a wallet, Mr. You Barkley. You see, Sergeant? Yeah, but... She put it there. She slipped it in my pocket while we were driving. This is Hamilton's wallet, and this is the same caliber gun that killed him, Barkley. But I tell you, I didn't kill him. It's all a lie. Oh, oh, hello, Mr. Ridgely. Thanks for coming right over. The lad's right, Sergeant. He didn't kill him. Dad. It's no use, Doris. I appreciate what you're trying to do, but you can't protect me. Dad, please don't say anything. I said it's no use, dear. You can release them, Sergeant. This young man and my daughter... I killed Hamilton. He was no good. I... I shot and killed him. The surprises are hitting you like punches from a fighter, aren't they, Van? The attempted frame against you by Doris. And now, out of the blue, her father, facing the police, admitting that he killed Hamilton. You stare from one to the other, wondering and waiting. And then Doris breaks the silence. But, Dad, you couldn't have killed Hamilton. Why couldn't he? He just confessed. That's good enough for me. He confessed to protect me. Dad had no reason. He to... could have had the best reason in the world. Blackmail. That was Hamilton's racket. Blackmail? And that's the answer, Doris. Hamilton had been bleeding me for a long time. But a few days ago, I got the evidence to clear myself and expose him. So you sent for him and told him. He got tough and... Uh... I shot him. I had to. In self-defense. Oh, look, officer, you found the gun in Hamilton's wallet on this man right here. What more do you want? I tell you, I never saw this girl in my life until last night. It's no use, Doris. It happened exactly as I said. No, Dad, I know you didn't do it. There's only one way you could know, Miss Ridgely. Yes, Sergeant. There's only one way I could know. I tell you, my daughter is lying. Mr. Ridgely is right, Sergeant. Oh, oh hello, Lieutenant. Find anything? Plenty. Your daughter's lying to protect him. We know from the gas station attendant's testimony that the shot that killed Hamilton was fired last night at ten minutes to eight. We've checked every move of Miss Ridgely's, and at ten minutes of eight, she was seen buying a pack of cigarettes at the corner drugstore. Then it was Mr. Ridgely. Uh Uh-uh. Mr. Ridgely left Hamilton in his living room last night somewhere around seven o'clock, probably after telling him he was going to expose him to the police. At ten minutes to eight, Mr. Ridgely was seen having a drink at the sea house. So, Barkley, you did take Hamilton's wallet. It was your gun. I tell you, I never even heard of any of these people. It wasn't young Romeo here either. And who? Alfred Hamilton committed suicide. Suicide? That's right. There's no doubt about it. Powder burns on his face. He was left-handed. The angle of the bullet in the left temple shows the wound was self-inflicted. And tests prove beyond a doubt that Hamilton fired a shot a few seconds before his death. I guess when he realized Mr. Risley was going to expose him to the police, he just couldn't take it. Now, Mr. Risley, if you'll come into my office a minute, I'll show you the reports. Uh, Dad, we'll wait in the car. I'll be along in a minute, Doris. Well, baby, they gave me a nice ride. A very nice ride. Oh, honestly, Van, I'm terribly sorry, but... I was worried crazy about Dad. Van, do you think we could have that drink again? Sometime, maybe? Oh, look. You're a nice kid. You're beautiful, fascinating, all those things. Especially beautiful. But, baby, if you ever see me walking down the street again, just go on by. Please. Please.
featured in tonight's story were Jack Webb and Joan Banks. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Hazel Lytle and John Dunkel, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Lickett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a robbery detail. You get a call from an informant telling you that three known gangsters have moved into your city. You don't know who they are or why they're in Los Angeles. Your job, check them out. To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. What do the latest reports show about Chesterfield? Well, our research laboratory has compared it with the leading cigarettes in the country. Chesterfield is highest in quality. Low in nicotine. Another good reason why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you will find Chesterfield really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, August 4th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Chief of Detective Stad Brown. My name's Friday. We were on our way out from the office, and it was 9.42 a.m. when we got to the Osborne Turkish Bath. Steam room. Hot, isn't it? Yeah. It must be Dell back there. Yeah. Dell? Yeah, who is it? It's Friday and Smith. Oh, I'll be right with you. Okay. Hey, Joe, did you ever have one of these? One of what? Turkey's bass. You ever had one? No, no, I never have. I understand they're great for colds. You just sit there and it burns the germs right out. It's great. You ever have one? No, but Armin, my brother-in-law, he takes them all the time. He tells me about how it does for colds. Next time he has one, I think I'll go with him. Yeah, it's a good idea. All right. Sorry to keep you waiting. We've been having trouble with the boiler. Got to keep a close check on the steam pressure in here. That's okay. Let's get out of here, huh? Well, it won't make me unhappy. It sure is hot, Dell. Come on upstairs. We can talk there. Okay. What do you got for us, Dell? I uh, might not go any place, but I thought I'd fill you guys in on it. Mm-hmm. Fellow rolled in here last night. Must have been about ten thirty. Night man's out with a cold, so I had to fill in. A cold? Yeah, some kind of virus or something. Oh yeah. Come on, we can talk in the office. <coughs> Sit down, you. Mind if I go over some of these bills while we talk? No, go ahead. Well, uh, this bimbo pulls in here last night, really carrying a load. I registered him and had Jimmy take him upstairs. Guy's kind of loud, you know, rolling all over the place. I wanted to get him upstairs to a room, figuring he'd sack out, and we wouldn't hear no more from him. Yeah. Well, he had a different idea. A couple minutes later, he comes downstairs, wants to know what's going on. What do you mean? Wants to know where the steam room is. Says he's not going to sit in a little room all night. He paid for his steam bath. That's what he wants. Yeah. When he starts to talk about his high-powered friends and this dealer out pull, I kind of figure there's something wrong. You tell you who the friends were? No, not right now. I just mentioned a guy named Bud. Kept talking how Bud was going to be sore at him because he got drunk. Must have said it a hundred times. How Bud was going to be real sore. Sounded to me like this Bud is the big man in the deal. I see. No idea what the deal is, though, huh? No, most he said was that when they left town, they were all going to have a lot of money. More money than I'd ever seen. You got the name on this guy? Oh, here's the register here. Let's see. Uh... Hey, you can see right here. Uh... Uh-huh. Vernon Carmichael, Los Angeles. Didn't give an address, huh? Once he mentioned he had to meet Bud at a hotel down on South Flower. Didn't say which one, though. Well, Flower's a long street, Dell. That doesn't help much. Didn't give any ideas at all of what the deal was going to be, huh? No, it must be a good one, though. Why do you say that? Well, when I took him up to his room last night, I could see his clothes hanging on a chair. Yeah. On top of his coat, he had a shoulder holster. Looked like a forty-five automatic in it. 
The way I look at it, the guy that's carrying that kind of muscle is figuring on scoring heavy. Did you make any phone calls while he was here? No. Anybody had the room since he left? No, I told the cleanup man to leave it alone. Figured you'd want to go over it. That's a good idea. What time did he leave this morning? Jimmy says it was about 7.30. I figured sure he'd sleep most of the morning. If I'd have known he was going to leave that early, I'd have called you last night. Mm-hmm. Well, we better take a look at that room, Dell. Might be able to come up with something that'll tell us who he is. I got something else for you. Yeah, what's that? I mentioned this Carmichael to Jimmy last night. Told him that I thought there was something wrong. Yeah. The reason the guy left so early is that he got a call from somebody. Guess it's the guy that picked him up. Did this Jimmy see who it was? No, did the next best thing, though. Yeah, what's that? Got the license number of the car. Ten fifteen a.m., we got in touch with Leighton Prince, and Harlan Stahl sent a crew out to go over the room. Frank put in a call to the record bureau, and he had the name Vernon Carmichael checked. There was no record on anyone answering the description that we'd gotten from the manager of the Turkish band. In addition, a radiogram was sent to the Department of Motor Vehicles in Pennsylvania, asking for all available information on the owner of the car bearing the license number that we'd been given. 11.30 a.m., Harlan Stahl's crew finished checking the room, and they told us that they'd been able to lift a complete set of clean fingerprints from a water glass. They were photographed and classified. In checking our files, there was no record of the prints. They were forwarded to George Breton up at Sacramento to CII and to the FBI in Washington, D.C. Two days passed. On Friday, August 6th, we got the word from DMV in Pennsylvania that the car was registered to a Howard Nielsen. The radiogram also gave us a description of the car and the registered owner's address in Pittsburgh. On receipt of this information, we got in touch with the police department in Pittsburgh and found that Howard Bud Nielsen had a misdemeanor record. Late Friday afternoon, the kickback from Washington, D.C. arrived with the information that the fingerprints found in the room at the Turkish bath were those of Vernon Carmichael. His record listed arrests for petty theft and robbery in Pennsylvania. He'd been brought to trial, but he'd been acquitted. Both men were well known to the police department in Pittsburgh as hoodlums. On Saturday morning, the mugshots of both Nielsen and Carmichael arrived. 10.15 a.m., we met with Lieutenant Jack Smyers, and we decided that the information coupled with the records of the two men made the incident worth investigation. The mug shots of the pair were copied, and a canvas of the hotels on South Flower Street was started in an attempt to find the residence of the suspects. The search went on for another two days without results. Monday, August 9th, 11.47 a.m., Frank and I got back to the office from communications. You know, we're going to feel pretty silly if Carmichael and Nielsen are already back there. Yeah, you know. Getting to look like the tip from Dell about the hotel on Flower was off, huh? Yeah. Still a lot of places to check, though. Mm-hmm. Righty? Yeah. We got it for you. What? Carmichael and Nielsen. We found the hotel. At 10.30 that morning, officers Murphy and Rafferty had gotten the first affirmative answer to their questions about the suspects. A room clerk in a small hotel at the corner of South Flower Street and Bunker Hill Avenue had recognized the mugshots of Carmichael and Nielsen. Further questioning brought out the name of the third man in the trio. He was identified as Ernest Hunter. A check of the name through our records netted us no new information on him, and the name in the description was forwarded again to Brereton up at CII in Sacramento, and again to Pittsburgh for possible identification. In talks with Lieutenant Smyers and Chief of Detective Stad Brown, it was decided to keep the man under 24-hour surveillance. Three additional teams of men from robbery detail were assigned to the duty. For the next seven days, the three men were under constant watch. Their habits were regular. Their movements during the day followed the same general pattern. The kickback on Ernest Hunter disclosed no criminal record. At the end of the first week of watching the men, it was decided that the next step in the operation was to place a microphone in their room so that we might be able to monitor their conversations. Frank and I got in touch with the sound crew at the crime lab, and we made arrangements with them. The necessary permits were obtained from the Federal Communications Commission, and the listening equipment itself was ready. We made arrangements with radio car officers to pick up the suspects for investigation. The sound crew, Frank and I, along with Murphy and Rafferty, stood by for word that the trio was in custody. Tuesday night, 9.40 p.m. Should be getting word pretty quick. Yeah. Red 2 to Red 1. Red 2 to Red 1. Come in, Red 1. That's Murph. Yeah. Red 1 to Red 2. Come in, Red 2. Any word yet? Over. No, not yet. We're all set. The manager's apartment. Monitor now. Sounds like they got him. Yeah, you want to take it? Yeah. Stand by, Red 3. Outpost 1 to monitor. Outpost 1 to monitor. Go ahead. Monitor to Outpost 1. Information received that suspects are in custody. Repeat, suspects are in custody. Acknowledge. Outpost 1 to monitor. Outpost 1 to monitor. Message received. Outpost 1 out. You heard it. Now. 
Red 1 to red 2 and red 3. Red 1 to red 2 and red 3. You read me red 2 and 3? Red 2 to red 1. Read 2. Red 3 to red 1. Receiving clearly. Red 1 to red 3. Suspects are now in custody. Proceed with installation of listening equipment. Over. Roger, Red 1. Red 3, please keep contact. Will do, Red 1. Red 3 out. Red 1 to Red 2. Come in, Red 2. Red 2 to Red 1. Murph, can you see the suspect's apartment from where you are? Not good, Joe. It's down the hall and around the corner. First door. Over. Red 1 to Red 3. Come in, Red 3. Red 3 to Red 1. Are you in the apartment yet? Yeah, Joe. We're just starting to install the bug. Is there a radio in the room? Yeah, a small table model. It's on the nightstand next to the bed. Can you fix that before you leave? Yeah, I'll pull one of the wires so it won't work. Good. Where are you putting the bug? We're landing under the edge of the carpet near the door to the kitchen. Should be able to pick up the whole room from there. Well, there's nothing to do now until we get it finished, huh? Yeah. We've got the recorder all set up? Yeah, it's in the room. Sound crew came in this afternoon and made the installation on it. Mm-hmm. You know how to work it? Yeah, I think so. Jack, check me out. It's pretty simple. Just like playing the piano. Press a key and away it goes. Well, I hope you got it. I've always had trouble with them. Last time out, I wanted to rewind one of the spools and listen to something. Ended up erasing everything we had. Yes, I remember that very well. I was afraid you wouldn't. Red 3 to Red 1. Red 3 to Red 1. Come in, Red 1. It's the sound crew. Yeah. Red 1 to Red 3. As completed installation, we're leaving the apartment. Have you seen anybody in the halls? No, all clear. We've had more than our share of luck on this one, Joe. Yeah, let's hope it holds out. Eleven fifteen p.m. The installation of the listening equipment was completed, and Frank and I, along with Officer Pat Murphy, took up our positions in the room we intended to use as a monitoring post. Officer Rafferty went back to the city hall and told them that we'd finished and we were ready to have the suspects released. In the meantime, Carmichael, Nielsen, and Hunter had been fingerprinted and mugged. A search of their persons had failed to reveal any incriminating evidence, and the time that they'd been held had allowed us to make the necessary installation. After the trio had been released, we received information that they were proceeding toward the hotel. Frank, Murphy, and I waited for them at the monitor post to come into their room. 12.35 a.m. That's them. Get the recorder, huh? Right. You want to take care of the log, Frank? Yeah. See, it's 12.36 a.m. That's it. Lousy deal, boy. Just wanted to ask some questions, that's all. That's what you think. They had a reason. You're so smart, you tell me why. Ah, shut up. Will you, Carl? I know you weren't such a big man when he started asking you the questions. You ought to kind of say how he was going to cut them all. Why don't you shut up? Probably when you got cranked up for that Turkish bath, that's probably what tipped him. What tip? A couple of uniform cops stopped us on a routine investigation. They got nothing. Anything else you think you'd let us go? Well, do you? You think you'd let us go? Oh, why don't you dry up? Hunter? Yeah? Turn on the radio, will you? Get some music. Yeah. And next time you get tanked, come back here. Uh, don't go roaming all over town. That's why they picked us up. You said something. What did I say? You know what I said, huh, do you? You being a big man, you tell me what I said to him. They picked me up. Go ahead, tell him. You said something. I don't know what it was, but you shut up your mouth. Hey, Hunter, what's the matter with the radio? I thought you'd not turn it off. I'm fine, dude. Keep broken. Don't worry. That doesn't make any difference. You open your mouth anymore, you got more trouble you can handle. That's the way it must be you. Yeah. If you guys don't shut up, I'm going to throw one of you out of here. Now shut up and get some sleep. Good night. Good night. And that's the way it went for the next five days. When the men were in the room, they argued continually. They talked about the deal they were working on, but from their conversation, there was no way of learning what they planned. When they left the room, they were constantly under surveillance, but their movements were routine. They took their meals in the same restaurant. They went to movies. They sat in bars, always together. During the time they were out of the apartment, they made no local contacts. They received no telephone calls. They made none. We knew that they were planning something, but there was no way of knowing what it was. All conversation in the room was recorded and listened to over and over again in the hope that we could come up with some kind of a lead. But the time spent in replaying the recordings netted us nothing. From what they'd said, we figured that whatever they were planning would take place on either Tuesday, August 17th, or on Wednesday, August 18th. On Tuesday, three-way cars were assigned to the streets in front of the hotel, but the suspects acted as usual. On Wednesday, they didn't leave their room. Frank, Murphy, and I continued to wait. On the streets outside, three other teams of men were standing by in undercover cars. 9.30 p.m. 
That's their telephone. Get the recorder, Murph. Yeah. 9.31 p.m. Yeah. Units 1K89, 1K88, 1K87. Suspects are leaving room. Suspects are leaving room. Outpost 1 out. All right, let's go. I wish we knew what it was. It sounds like it might be narcotics. Well, it could be. Doesn't make a lot of difference, does it? Yeah. At least we know it's something. By the time we got to the street, the suspects were getting into their car and pulling away from the curb. Frank Murphy and I got to our car and followed them. They drove down South Flower to the corner of Palm Drive and turned left. Three blocks further, they pulled into a gas station and apparently asked directions. They turned south on Broadway and drove about a mile. At Santa Barbara Avenue, they turned left again and drove three blocks. They stopped and parked the car in front of a small bar. We informed the other units of the activity and asked them to stand by in the area. Carmichael got out of the car and entered the bar. Murphy left us and entered the bar after him. Carmichael returned in a few minutes with another man. The two of them got back into the car and they talked. At the end of that time, all four of the men got out of the automobile, and then they entered the bar. Shortly after that, Carmichael, Nielsen, and Hunter walked out of the place. Carmichael was carrying a small package wrapped in plain brown paper and tied with a string. The fourth man wasn't with him. Frank and I got out of our car and approached the men as they stood talking. All right, hold it up, police officers. Over there. Put your hands up on that wall. What's going on? Get your hands up there. Frank, you want to check in the package? Yeah. Keep your hands on that wall. Lousy deal. I hope you're happy, Carmichael. I hope you're real happy. What are you talking about? I've got to lay this one to you. You really took care of this. Stand still and keep quiet. How about it, Frank? I don't know. What do you mean? Where's money? $20 bills. Must be fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 worth. Queer? As far as I can tell, it's good. Well, where's that put us? Well, there's $20,000 here. Yeah. Let's find out where they got it. <laughs> Listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. There are good reasons why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Why Chesterfield is the largest selling two way cigarette in America. Why Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. People these days want facts. When you want people to use your product, you have to tell them what effect it has on people who do use it regularly. That's why a doctor has examined for almost two years a large group of Chesterfield smokers. Forty-five percent of them have, on the average, been smoking Chesterfields for well over ten years. What is the effect on these people from smoking Chesterfield? No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses, says the doctor. Consider Chesterfield's record with these smokers, with millions of other smokers throughout America. Another good reason for you to change to Chesterfield. Regular or king-size, Chesterfield is best for me, best for you. Ten oh two a.m. The four suspects were taken into custody and removed to the city hall for interrogation. We got in touch with the Secret Service and asked them to come over to the office to check on the currency. The agent arrived and, after looking at the money, pointed out several minute mistakes that had been made in the engraving of the plates. He went on to explain, however, that this particular printing was one of the best that he'd ever seen. He told us that the paper used in the bills would be analyzed and that we'd receive copies of the reports as soon as they were finished. 12.14 a.m. While Murphy Rafferty and the Secret Service man questioned Nielsen in the interrogation room, Frank and I talked to Carmichael in the squad room. We questioned him for about an hour, but he refused to say anything that would help us get a lead to the source of the counterfeit. 1.30 a.m. How long do you figure you can keep this up, Carmichael? I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, now, come off it. We're getting tired of playing kid games here. We want to know where the queer came from now. Who says it's queer? The guy that printed it was pretty sloppy. He made a lot of mistakes. Yo. Yeah, Mark. See you, man. Yeah. Be right back. Yeah. How you doing? Nothing. Nielsen won't say a word. Gives it to us that he didn't know what was going on. Says he just went out there to pick up a package. They say who they were running the errand for? Well, tells us just he went along for the ride. The whole thing was Carmichael's idea. Mm-hmm. We thought maybe we'd go to work on Hunter, see what we can get from him. Okay. 
You going to stick with Carmichael? Yeah, I guess so. From what we heard in the room, if there's going to be a break, I got a hunch it's going to come from him. Okay. You got anything, let us know, huh? Right away. Oh, big man's back again. Your friend there tell you all about it? No, but yours did. Hmm? Nielsen just laid the whole thing in your lap. You're kidding. So you want to talk to him? What'd he say? Well, he tells it. He was just along for the ride. You're the big wheel in the whole thing. He said that? I said you could talk to him if you want to. Well, he ain't going to make it. He ain't going to lay it on me. You want to tell us your side of it? Yeah, I'll tell you the way it happened. That lousy bum. How do you like that, him saying I'm the wheel? I'll tell you. All right, now, where'd the queer come from? I don't know. I thought you were going to tell us. I'm doing that. I really don't know where it came from. You turn up with $20,000 and $20 bills, and you ask us to believe that you don't know where it was printed. I'm not asking you anything. I'm telling you what I know. That's it. Well, tell us about your part. Nielsen, Hutter, and me were approached in Pittsburgh. By who? I don't know. We're going that way again, huh? I say you don't believe me. That's the way it happened. The guy who approached you, he just walked up and said, here's 20,000 bucks, just like that, huh? No, the deal was that Nielsen, Hunter, and me were supposed to come out here. We were supposed to check into a hotel and wait for a call. Guy who called us would have the queer. He'd turn it over to us and we'd pass it. You bought the counterfeit? Yeah. What'd you pay for it? Two and a half. For $20? Yeah, two and a half for 20. You paid the other man we picked up? Yeah, we gave him 2,500 bucks. You ever seen a man before? What? The man you bought the queer from. Do you know him? No, I never saw him before. He's not the man who made the original contact in Pittsburgh. No, a guy back east was an old man. How old? I don't know, maybe 55, 60, around in there. Not the fellow you met tonight. I told you that before. It's not the same man. You're going to use a name of any kind? No. It's just to call him Pop, that's all. Pop. Give us a description of this man, Pop. What's in it for me? Well, what do you got now? Nothing. All right, it'll stay that way. You're in big trouble, Carmichael. If you're smart at all, you're going to cop out the whole thing and cooperate with us. Lousy Nielsen. Him all the time yelling about how it was all set. All the time saying we had it made. Sure, I'll go with you. I just want to see Nielsen get his, that's all. Just want to see him get his. We're going to want you to look at some pictures, too. I told you I'd go the route. You just tell me what you want to know. If I got the answer, so have you. All right. What'd he tell you? What? That lousy Nielsen. What'd he tell you about how it happened? You tell you the way I did? You tell it that way? Pretty much, yeah. Sure, that's the way it happened. Can't be told any other way. Well, Nielsen might give you an argument there. Further interrogation of the other three men in the operation served to corroborate the story that we've been given by Carmichael. Twenty-five hundred dollars in cash was found on the fourth suspect. Once the other men were confronted with the fact that Carmichael had told us everything he knew concerning the operation, they all followed suit. But other than telling us that they knew the head man in the counterfeiting act as Pop, they couldn't come up with any further information. From the man who'd been in the bar, we learned that he'd met Pop in Pittsburgh. He also told us that as far as he knew, the counterfeiter had been in prison at one time or another. However, the suspect was unable to tell us in what state or on what charges Pop had served time. He went on to tell us that he'd gotten the money in Pittsburgh and that Pop had told him that he'd be contacted later. The Secret Service had completed their analysis of the counterfeit bills and they told us that they were some of the most perfect printing jobs that they'd run across. The counterfeiter had made one major mistake, however. In the printing of the currency, he'd impregnated the paper with small silken hairs so that it would stand close inspection. The currency now in use is made with nylon hairs. The agent from the Secret Service told us that they had agents working on tracing the manufacture of the paper in the hopes that they could come up with a lead as to the identity of Pop. The four suspects were booked into the city jail. Thursday, August 19th, we ran the name Pop through our moniker file. Of the 47 cards turned over to us by the record bureau, 19 of the suspects listed matched the descriptions that we've been given. The pictures of the men were pulled and shown to Carmichael and the other three suspects. They were unable to give us an identification. The name and description was sent to George Brereton in Sacramento, and he sent us another 150 possible. These were checked out without result. The nickname and physical description of the man was sent to Washington, and we got back over a thousand names and pictures. It took us six weeks working with the Secret Service to check out these possibles. The results, nothing. Tuesday, October 5th, Frank and I got back to the office. I get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, wait a minute. Wait till I get that down. All right, go ahead. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, well, it should check out. Mm-hmm. Right. Okay, we'll meet you. What you got? Report of the paper and the queer bills just came through. Yeah. Looks like we found Pop. Checking the manufacturers of paper similar to that used in the counterfeit $20 bills, the Secret Service had come up with the name of a small print shop in the eastern section of Los Angeles. The paper used was of an unusual type, and there were not many orders for it. This particular shop had ordered large quantities of it in the past and was continuing to use it. In checking out the name of the man on the order blanks, the Secret Service had found that he'd been convicted of robbery and had served a term in the federal penitentiary in Atlanta. 
He'd been released and had come to California and opened a small print shop. We spent the next two days checking the suspect out. His name was given as Stanley Jackson, age 47. For the next week, the print shop and Jackson himself were kept under constant surveillance. On Thursday, October 14th at 11.50 p.m., the suspect was followed to his print shop. I'll cover the front of the shop, Joe. Right, man. Come on, Frank. Yeah. Joe? Yeah. Sounds like a press, doesn't it? Yeah. Come on. The back door is around here. You see what's going on in there? No. Got the windows all painted over. Hmm. What do you figure? Well, it doesn't leave us with a lot of choice. If we go in and he's not printing counterfeit, we're going to make him so hinky that we might never nail him. Yeah. If we don't go in, he might get rid of the place and we're in trouble there, too. Yeah, like I said, we haven't got much choice, have we? All right, let's go. What's going on? What are you doing in here? Police officers, you're under arrest. You want to take the press, Frank? Right. You've got no right to come in here like this. I know my rights. You haven't got a warrant. You've got no right to act like this. You want to kill it, Frank? I got it. The place for the press, Joe. Doing the green overlay. Take a look. Yeah. You haven't got any right touching those. They're mine. They belong to me, mister. Where'd you get the plates, Jackson? They're good, aren't they, mister? The very best. Where'd you get them? Made them? Made them myself. Where'd you learn engraving? In prison. When they sent me to prison, I learned all about engraving. Real engraving. Not photo process, but the real thing. Finest place I've ever seen. The best. Beautiful money, isn't it? Best I've ever seen. Fool anybody. Did it all myself. Pass it anywhere. Fool anybody. Anywhere. Yeah. Just look at it, mister. That's a genuine article, isn't it? Real money. It's perfect. Absolutely perfect, mister. No, you're wrong there. Hmm? The government didn't print it. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On January 11th, trial was held in federal court, Southern District of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Fenneman. Friends, we've tried very hard to set a dragnet standard. Now, to put that in just a few words, we try to make each program the kind of entertainment that you want. Now, we're going to keep working real hard at that. And you know, the people who make Chesterfields feel the same way about their cigarette. To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. And the latest reports from our research lab shows Chesterfield is highest in quality. Highest in quality, low in nicotine. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Chesterfield. Regular or king size. They're milder. They're satisfying. They're best for me. Best for you. Vernon Alex Carmichael, Howard Raymond Nielsen, Ernest Richard Hunter, Philip Roger Harger, and Stanley Norman Jackson were tried and convicted of violation of Title 18, U.S. Code, Section 474, printing and issuing counterfeit money. Violation of this title is punishable by a fine of $5,000 and imprisonment in a federal penitentiary for a period not to exceed 15 years. You have just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Clarence Cassell, Jack Crucian, Harry Bartell. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Have you tried new cork tip Fatima? It's the smooth smoke with Fatima tips of perfect cork. King size for longer filtering and Fatima quality for a much better flavor and aroma. Remember, Fatima with tips of perfect cork is made and guaranteed by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to give you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. A young girl has been found in a cheap hotel room, apparently an attempted suicide. There's reason to suspect foul play. Your job, investigate. To sell a product, you have to make it good and keep it good. What do the latest reports show about Chesterfield? Well, our research laboratory has compared it with the leading cigarettes in the country. Chesterfield is highest in quality, low in nicotine. Another good reason why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you'll find Chesterfield really mild, really satisfying. Best for you. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 19th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner is Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Warman. My name's Friday. We just gotten a call from Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, and it was 9.46 a.m. when we got to the second floor, the treatment room. Yes? Could I see Dr. Hall, please? Come in, Joe. Joe, Frank? Hi, Hi. Doc. This the girl? Yeah. How's she doing? I'm well, not sure yet. Just finished the transfusion. Well, when are you going to know? We think she's going to live, but there's no way of telling right now how much damage has been done to the brain tissue. Mm-hmm. Bad bruise on her face. Must have received a bad blow. Might have gotten when she fell. Mm-hmm. Let's go outside. Huh? I can use the smoke. Okay. Well, if there's any change, I'll be out in the hall. All right, Doctor. You've got a cigarette on fresh on. Yeah, here you are. Frank? Yeah, thanks. Here's a match. <sighs> thanks. I didn't know you gave transfusions in cases like this, Doc. Well, I have to very often. You see, a thing like this, the carbon monoxide in the gas joins with the hemoglobin in the red cells. won't let go. Blood takes the monoxide through the system and suffocates the brain tissue. We've given her some coramine. Helps speed up the heart action. The way it looks, she's got a good chance of living, but we won't know how bad it really is until later. It's a rough one, isn't it? You find out who she is? Well, according to the stuff we found in her wallet, her name's Mona Fenton. Another thing that doesn't make much sense, Doc, she registered into the hotel as Mrs. John Norris. Near as we can find out, she wasn't married. How'd you come up with that? Well, when the office got word about it, we tried to get in touch with her husband. We called the phone number on the ID that we found in her wallet, talked with her mother... She says a girl's single. Well, how about the guy she was with? Have you been able to talk to him? No. I haven't found out who he is. Name doesn't check out, huh? Not that we can find. How about the mother? she give you anything? Well, we just talked to her for a minute. We're going over there when we leave here. Maybe she can come up with some answers. I sure hope so. A couple of more questions you can ask her. Yeah? What's that? Find out if the girl's been under a doctor's care. Well, what do you mean? Checked her over when she came in. Found marks. On her arm? Yeah. I think she's an addict. At 8.30 a.m. that morning, a guest in a small hotel on Grand Avenue had thought that he detected the odor of gas in the halls of the building. He notified the desk clerk, and together they conducted a search of the premises. Finally, they ascertained that the escaping gas was coming from a room on the third floor of the hotel. When the desk clerk got no answer to his calls, he used a passkey to open the door. Sprawled across the bed was a girl who appeared to be in her early 20s. The gas heater in the room had been turned on full and the windows were closed, locked and stuffed with pieces of torn sheets to keep the fumes in the room. The quick action of the desk clerk had undoubtedly saved the girl's life. While the hotel guest called an ambulance, the clerk turned off the gas, opened the windows, and administered artificial respiration to the girl until the ambulance crew arrived. As an attempted suicide, the homicide detail had to make an investigation and Frank and I were assigned to the case. After we talked to Doc Hall at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, we drove down to the hotel where the girl had been found. Right in here. Anybody been in this room since the other officers left? No, sir. They told me to lock it until you could see it. All right, sir. 
Well, this is just the way you found it, is that right? Well, yes, of course. The gas is turned off, and I opened the windows, but uh, everything else is the same. I see. Well, from what you said on the phone, she came in last night, is that right? Yes, sir. Uh, at least that's what the registration book says. They checked in at uh, 10.15. Did you take care of them? No, I was out to dinner when they got here. Who checked them in? Jeff, Jeff Christensen. Is he around? No, not right now. He'll probably be back tonight. You know where we can find him? I don't know. See, Jeff got paid last night. Got his week's wages. Last I saw him, he was on his way out on the town with some of his friends. Jeff goes out on the town. Maybe we don't see him in a couple of days. I see. But you figure he'll be back tonight, huh? Oh, yes, yes. Jeff only worked a couple of days last week, so he ain't going to go on much of the town. Mm-hmm. Did you see the man Miss Fenton came in with? No, I didn't. You were already in the room when I got back from dinner. I uh, checked the book. I got the money from Jeff before I left. The man must have gone out sometime earlier this morning. I guess I was asleep. My room's just back of the desk. Fella must have got out while I was asleep. I see. Did you get any calls from the room at all? Not a one. Like I told those uniformed officers we hear, I didn't see them at all. Not a people. As a matter of fact, I was thinking how nice and quiet they were. But, but the way the room looks, they sure must have had some sort of argument. Yes, yeah, sir. Uh-huh. Would you know if they brought any baggage with them? Matter of fact, I know they didn't. Sure looks like they did some heavy drinking, don't it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Glasses. That bottle's almost empty. Yeah. I'd rather you wouldn't touch the bottle. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, I won't. Say, uh, you talked to the girls' people yet? No, sir, we haven't. But you plan to see them, aren't you? Yes, sir. Yeah, I wonder if you'd do me a favor. You, you know when you see a people? Yes, sir. What's that? Well, I, I don't much mind the dirty glasses and having to straighten the room up. That's all part of the hotel business. But I wish you'd say something about the torn sheets. Tell the people about them. I don't want to cause no trouble, but maybe if they know how about the sheets were all torn up, they'd want to make good on them. You will mention them, won't you? Hmm? Yes, sir. I'll call the office, Joe. Have them send out a crew, see what prints we can lift. All right, fine. Who else has a pass key to this room? Oh, you mean beside me? Yes, sir. Well, ain't nobody. Where's the key kept? That hangs on a nail next to the desk. That big nail there. It hangs right on it. Mm-hmm. When you came into the room, did you notice if there was anything around the door to keep the gas inside? Uh, I don't follow you. Well, you found pieces of torn sheets around the windows, you say. Now, was there anything like that with the door? Oh, oh, yes, I'm with you now, yeah. Now, let me think. As I remember, no, no, there wasn't nothing there, just around the windows. Mm-hmm. Was the key in the lock when you came up here? You mean inside the room? Yes, sir, that's right. No, no, the reason I know that for sure is that I looked through the keyhole. Tried to see what was in the room. No, sir. He wasn't in. Of course, I <laughs> don't mean nothing. Sir? Well, only a couple of the rooms have keys anyway. We don't use them anymore. You mean you don't lock the doors? Sure, we lock the doors. We got them all locked all the time. This is a respectable hotel. Of course, we lock the doors. But not with those keys. We got those other locks on the doors. Oh, I see. You see? Yeah, see that? Sort of like Yale locks? That kind, you know. That's uh, what locks the doors, not the other keys. Yes, I see. Of course we lock the doors. Yes, sir. The locks catch when the doors close, though. Is that right? Yeah, locks them tight. I got in touch with Lee Jones, Joe. He sent a crew right over. Good. I checked with Doc Hall. How's the girl? Oh, she's coming along. Doc says she's doing better. Oh, these fellows that you're going to have roaming around here. What's this all about? Is something wrong? We're not sure yet, sir. Oh, dear, dear. It always happens like this, don't it? What's that, sir? I try to run a respectable place. Goodness knows I do. I keep it right up to date. It's good service, and something like this happens. There was no reason for that girl to do a thing like this. Not in my hotel. Now you cops come in here. Cops going to be all over the place. Tenants aren't going to like it. They ain't going to like it at all. Just because of that girl. Why'd she have to come in here and do a thing like this? Why'd she have to do it at all, sir? <laughs> a.m. We questioned the people in the hotel. None of them could remember hearing any undue noise coming from the room where the girl had tried to kill herself. Normally, the investigation would have been routine, but with the possibility of foul play, we had to check every angle and then check it again. The crew from the crime lab arrived and went over the room. Under the bed, they found an empty capsule, the type commonly used to dispense heroin. They also came up with a clean set of fingerprints on both glasses. They were photographed, and the water glasses themselves were removed to the crime lab to be booked as evidence. The registration card the couple had signed was turned over to Don Meyer in handwriting. 
The name was checked through our record bureau, through the phone book, and through the city directory. But when the leads were checked out, we were no further in knowing who the man was who'd taken the room with Mona Fenton. Word was left at the hotel for the handyman to contact us as soon as he returned. Word was also left that if the man who'd registered with the Fenton girl returned, we were to be called. 11.45 a.m., the men from the crime lab finished their investigation and returned to the office to compile the results. Frank and I left the hotel and drove out to the address listed on the girl's identification. It was a large white colonial home near one of the colleges. We rang the doorbell and waited. Yes. Miss Fenton? Yes, that's right. What is it you want? Police officers would like to talk to you. Oh, come in. Thank you. It's about Mona, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. I knew something like this would happen. I knew it all along. Beg your pardon? When she first had this crazy idea, when she first told me about it, I knew. Kids, try to tell them. Just try and they tell you that times have changed. They say that you're not keeping up with the time. They know it all. Nobody can tell them anything. Well, what idea is this, Mrs. Fenton? When she wanted to quit school and take the job in that drive-in restaurant. The most ridiculous thing I ever heard of. But nobody could talk her out of it. Lord knows I tried. I knew something like this would happen. I just knew it. Yes, ma'am. Do you know any reason why your daughter might want to take her own life? Are you a policeman, too? Yes, ma'am. I'm Frank Smith. This is my partner, Joe Friday. How do you do? How are you, ma'am? Do you know any reason why your daughter might want to kill herself? It's a little hard to say, Mr. Friday. What's that? Mona and I had quite an argument about her leaving school. It was one of those silly things that starts and gets all out of hand, you know. We both have pride, and neither one of us was going to back down. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen Mona to talk to for over a month. Does she live here, ma'am? Yes, she does, Mr. Smith. But there's an outside entrance to her room. She comes and goes as she pleases. Doesn't eat her meals here, so I hardly ever see her. Mm Mm-hmm. Do you know if she's been under a doctor's care? No, I don't think so. Why do you ask that? Well, is your daughter a diabetic? No, she isn't, Mr. Friday. Well, these questions about Mona and a doctor, what are you trying to find out? Does your daughter have any special boyfriends, Mrs. Fenton? She did have. Who was that? Richard Burdick, nice boy. Mona and he were planning to get married when they got out of school. Then, along with everything else, that just blew up. Everything seemed to go all at the same time. Did your daughter have any trouble with this Burdick? No, nothing you could call real trouble. It's just that they agreed to disagree. With Mona's idea, Richard didn't want anything to change. He was very much in love with her. Uh Uh-huh. Does he know about this? I don't think so, Miss Fenton. We haven't told him. I don't know what he's going to do when he hears about it. It's going to hit him awfully hard. He's the sensitive type. Does your daughter have any close friends that she might confide in? I suppose she does. She's talked about some of the girls where she worked. Would you give us their names, please? Oh, yes, I will. I'll write them down for you, those I can remember. All right, fine. Has your daughter been in good spirits lately? As far as I know, yes. She's always seemed happy enough when I saw her. I told you we haven't said much more than hello the last month, but she seemed happy. Uh-huh. You said that she broke up with this Burdick boy, is that right? Yes. When was that? Six weeks, two months ago. You know what caused it? The job, all the other things. Mona kept making dates with him and then breaking them at the last minute. I guess Richard just got tired of being stood up. Well, did he and your daughter have any arguments that you know of? No. They just decided that it wouldn't work out for them. They just decided to stop seeing each other. Did your daughter have any other steady boyfriends? Anyone that she saw quite a bit of, maybe? Well, there was one boy. He was quite a bit older than Mona. She saw a lot of him the last couple of weeks. You know who he was? No, I never met him. I only saw him once. What if you could describe him for us? No, I'm afraid I can't. He drove by for Mona one night, going to pick her up for a date. Parked out in front and honked the horn. I see. I went to the front door to tell him to come in. Mona wasn't ready yet, but he wouldn't. Just sat out there and waited. I didn't get a good look at him. Could you describe the car for us? Not good. It was one of those foreign cars, a convertible. I think it might have been a Jaguar. I'm not sure about that, though. But you're sure it wasn't an American automobile? Yes, I'm sure about that. All right. How about the color of the car? Can you tell us that? It was awfully dark out there. I'm not sure. I'd rather not say, officer, if I can't be sure. You understand that. I wouldn't want to tell you something and then have it turn out to be wrong. You can understand that, can't you? Yes, ma'am, of course. Did you see Mona this morning? Yes, we did. Is she all right? They think so, yes. Aren't you sure? Well, when we talked to the doctor, they were doing everything they could. They seemed to think that she was going to be all right. Thank God. It's so hard, Mr. Friday, to know that your child is sick, that she tried to kill herself, to want to go to her and not be able to... It's so hard. <laughs> Try to take it easy if you can, Miss Fenton. If you'll just give us the names of the girls that she might know, we'll be on our way. Yes, I'll write them for you. Thank you. Excuse me? Shirley? 
Hello? Yes, it is. What? Yes, they're here. Just a moment. It's for you. I'll get it, Jump. I'll get those names for you, oh. Mr. Friday. All right, fine. Right. Did your daughter ever refer to this man in the foreign car by name? No, I don't think she did. All I know is that whenever she went out with him, it was the big date of the bunch. How often did she see him? Maybe a couple of times a week. Might have been more. I had no way of knowing what she was doing. She kept pretty much to herself when she met him. But I could tell he was the big thing in her life. He was it. Go? Yeah. Stay a minute? Yes. Excuse me, Miss Finn. I'll finish this list. Thank you. Yeah. Call was from Jack Smyers at the office. Yeah. Just removed her to the general hospital. Yeah. She had a relapse. They don't think she's going to live. You are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. There are good reasons why thousands of people are changing to Chesterfield every day. Why Chesterfield is the largest selling two-way cigarette in America. Why Chesterfield is best for me and best for you. People these days want facts. When you want people to use your product, you have to tell them what effect it has on people who do use it regularly. That's why a doctor has examined for almost two years a large group of Chesterfield smokers. Forty-five percent of them have, on the average, been smoking Chesterfields for well over ten years. What is the effect on these people from smoking Chesterfield? No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses, says the doctor. Consider Chesterfield's record with these smokers, with millions of other smokers throughout America. Another good reason for you to change to Chesterfield. Regular or king size, Chesterfield is best for me, best for you. We obtained the name of the drive-in restaurant where the Fenton girl was employed. We also got the names of the girls that she worked with and the address of her boyfriend, Richard Burdick. Mrs. Fenton also gave us a list of names of persons who might be able to aid us in the investigation. Under further questioning, the mother was still unable to furnish us with a motive for her daughter's attempt to take her own life. The apparent lack of a motive, or any type of a suicide note coupled with the bruise on the girl's chin, made the likelihood of foul play more than possible. 12.57 p.m. We left the Fenton home and drove over to the drive-in. We stopped on the way and put in a call to the office. There still hadn't been any report of the handyman at the hotel, the only person who could give us a description of the man who'd registered at the place with the Fenton girl. When we got to the drive-in, we asked about a Peggy Greekson, one of the girls on the list. After a few minutes, the girl came over to our car. You want to see me? You Peggy Greekson? Yeah, why? We'd like to ask you some questions about Mona Fenton. Who are you guys? Police officers. We'd just like to talk to you. I gotta get it okayed with the manager. I'm on duty now, lunchtime. Pretty busy. I gotta get it okayed. I'll take care of it. All right, fine. I'll check with the manager, Joe. Right. Hope this isn't gonna take long. I got a couple of customers waiting for orders. My partner will take care of it. Why ain't the manager knowing that worries me? It's the tips they're gonna leave. You make what I do, and the tips are important. Yes, ma'am. What's all this about Mona, anyway? What are the cops after her for? Well, she tried to kill herself this morning. Mona? Yes. Why? Why'd she do a thing like that? Well, we thought maybe you could help us there. Why me? I haven't got anything to do with it. Well, we understand you're pretty friendly with it. Oh, sure. I was a friend of Mona's, but I don't know anything about no suicide. I don't know anything about it, and I don't want to. Do you know any reason she might try to take her own life? Not a reason in the world. Not Mona. Do you know if she was under a doctor's care for any reason? No. I mean, I don't know. She didn't say anything about it. Never said a word. Was she? Well, that's what we're trying to find out. Can you think of any enemies she had? Anybody who might have wanted to hurt her? How far is this going to go? Well, how do you mean, miss? I mean, who's going to hear about this? Who's going to hear the answers I'm going to give her? Well, no one. Now, what do you got for us? Well, I'll give you this for free. If anything happened to Mona, you go talk to Dick Burdick. Talk to him. He'll be able to tell you. Why do you say that? Because it's true. No other reason. He's a real bum. You ask me, I think there's something wrong with him. You know, in the head. Well, do you have any reason to say that? All the reason in the world. Poor girl, this bum all the time coming around giving her trouble. All the time telling her how he's going to kill her and anybody that comes near her. Burdick said that to Miss Fenton, did he? Half a dozen times. It wasn't more than a week ago. Mona told me she told him off, told him to get lost. She didn't want any part of him to leave her alone. He made a big scene. Mona told me all about it. One day, this Terry drove in here. Got one of those flashy foreign cars. The Jaguar? I think so, yeah. All right, go ahead. Well, one day, he drove into the place. Mona took care of him. I guess he liked Mona. He kept coming back, always parked in her station. 
Anyway, this Burdick kid found out about it. Wasn't anything for him to worry about, but he made a big thing about it. Mm-hmm. Told Mona she was supposed to stop seeing Terry. Said if she didn't, he was going to cause real trouble. Did he see what he was going to do? Well, I think he was kidding. I don't think he really meant it. He's just a kid. Well, what did he say? I really don't think he meant it. Well, all right. Now, what did he say to her? Said if he found them together again, kill them both. <laughs> We talked to the other girls on the drive-in. From them, we got the same story about the scenes that Richard Burdick had created. We got more information about the threats that he'd made against the Fenton girl and Terry Hamilton. From one of the girls, we got the address of Hamilton. 2.45 p.m. We left the drive-in and drove over to the address of the girl's boyfriend, Richard Burdick. We talked to the landlady. She told us that the Burdick boy had regular habits. He paid his rent on time. He never had any visitors. She told us that he wasn't in his room at that time, but she said that she'd let us in. In her company, we went upstairs. She unlocked the door, and Frank and I went in. I'll well, check the bedroom. I'll take the kitchen. Yeah. Well, there's nothing out there. How'd you do? Well, it looks like we're a little late. What? His clothes are gone. We checked the room further. Every indication was that Richard Burdick had left the apartment in a hurry. We talked to the landlady again. She could give us no reason for his disappearance. She gave us the name of his employer. We put in a call to them, but they told us that Bertie had failed to show up for work that day. 4.15 p.m. We put in a call to the hotel on Grand Avenue, but the handyman still hadn't returned and there'd been no word from him. We went back to the office and checked the name Richard Burdick through R&I, but we found no criminal record for anybody answering his description. We put out a local and an APB on him. At 4.39 p.m., we got a call from General Hospital telling us that the Fenton girl had regained consciousness and that we could talk to her. Frank and I left the office and traveled Code 2 out to the hospital. The doctor on duty told us that the girl was out of danger, but that she was very weak. He asked us not to get her excited, and he led us into her room. Miss Fenton? Yes, who are you? Police officers. Why can't you leave me alone? Go away. Just a couple of questions we'd like to ask you. I don't want to talk to anybody. Why, Why didn't you leave things the way they were? Why didn't you leave me alone? Well, you had a lot of people worried, miss. No reason for it. It'd be better all the way around if things had happened the way I planned them. And you did try to kill yourself? Yes. Who was with you in that hotel room? You mean Mr. Morris? Yeah. It was Terry. It was always Terry. He was going to marry me, then he didn't. He said he would, and he didn't. That way you did what you did? Yes. You use narcotics, Miss Fenton? Hmm? You use narcotics? Yes, that was Terry's idea, too. I think that's all he wanted with me, just to get me hooked so I'd have to do what he said. I think that was the reason. How about this Richard Burdick? What about him? Do you have anything to do with you deciding to take your own life? In a lot of ways. The biggest mistake I ever made was leaving Richard. I thought it was smart, real smart. I was going to show him. Terry said he'd marry me, said he was in love with me. He gets you started on narcotics? Yeah. At first, it wasn't so bad. I loved him, really, I did. Then when I had to have the fixes, he changed. Told me he couldn't give it to me anymore. That I was going to have to pay for it. I tried to tell him to tell him that I loved him. That I wanted to be with him. That's why I went to the hotel to talk it over. Try to come to an understanding. Some kind of an understanding. Mm -hmm. He said that he didn't want to have anything to do with me. That he wanted no part of me anymore said that I was going to have to pay for the H from now on. I didn't have any way to pay for it. He said it wasn't any of his business. Is he a user? Yes. It's all so stupid, all so stupid. Ma'am? The whole thing, I had it real good all the way around. And then I went ahead and ruined everything, tore it all down. Even if I'd have killed myself, it would have been no answer. Not the right answer, anyway. I know that. I know it real well. All right. Can you tell us where we can find this Terry? You bet I can. I want to see him feel like I do. I want him to know what it's like. Will you be willing to meet with him? Make a buy of narcotics for us? You name the time, I'll be there. I'll be there if I have to crawl. All right. You better get some rest now. I guess so. I'm pretty tired. Did you see my mother? Yes, ma'am. Is she real mad at me? No, I don't think she is. Would you call her? Ask her to come and see me? Tell her I'm sorry. Tell her I want to see her. 
Now, she'll be glad to hear that. I hope so. I got so much to tell her, her and Richard. So much to tell them both. All right, Miss Fenner. We'll get in touch with her. And you tell me when you want me to call Terry. You tell me. All right, we will. Terrible thing, isn't it? What's that? Terry. He's been around a long time. Must be other girls in the same fix all because of him. Girls who have a bad habit and have to do what he says. Girls like me, terrible. Nobody knows how many. Yes, ma'am. Where's it going to end? When you meet him. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 10th, trial was held in Department 98, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you, George Veneman. Obviously, it would be impossible for you to question all the Chesterfield smokers that you'd run into, yet we're convinced that you want to know what effect the product has on people who do use it regularly. Well, Chesterfield tells you. Now, you've heard the report from the doctor who's been examining Chesterfield smokers. No adverse effects to the nose, throat, and sinuses from smoking Chesterfield. And I think it would make good sense for you to change to Chesterfield today. Smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette. Regular or king size, you'll find Chesterfield's best for you. Terry Norris Hamilton was tried and convicted of violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony, one count. He received sentence as prescribed by law. Violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony, is punishable by imprisonment in the state penitentiary for a period of from one to five years. Mona Irene Fenton pled guilty to the same charge and was placed on probation for a period of three years with the provision that she be placed under the care of a competent psychiatrist. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Vic Rodman, Virginia Gregg, Gene Tatum. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Announcing the best of filter cigarettes, L&M filters. The L&M filter is entirely pure, harmless to health. Filters out the heavy particles in the smoke... Gives you more flavor, less nicotine. L&M filters and Fatima with tips of perfect cork, both made and guaranteed by the makers of Chesterfield, Liggett and Myers Tobacco Company. Here, John Cameron Swayze and the news next on the NBC Radio Network.